Good evening. Um, it's 6.30, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this December 10th, 2020 open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberation of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials are available on the Novus agenda dashboard. We recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus unless I note otherwise. We will shortly be turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do, uh, these will be the ground rules. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude, I will go down the list of members inviting each by name to provide any comment, question, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in such a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you. Um, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. So I am going to do roll. This is a very, very full agenda this evening. Um, so there are there are a lot of people on the agenda. So this is gonna take a little bit of time. I'm assuming we're on a couple of screens. Um, so um, Ms. Exton. Here. Mr. Cardin. Here. Dr. Allison Ampey. Here. Mr. Thielman. We can't. Here, here. Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Mr. Painter. Here. And I am here. Uh, Dr. Bodie. Present. Dr. McNeil. I don't see him yet. Um, here. here. Oh, there you are. You guys are really small tonight. Okay, uh, hold on. Um, Mr. Mason. Here. Mr. Spiegel. Here. Um, Ms. Almer. Here. Ms. Keys. Here. Um, Ms. Carmody. Here. All right. I think that's everybody on the circle. Now I'm gonna go through the agenda. So Ms. Baldwin. Hi. Hi. Um, Dr. Janger. Here. Mr. Meringer. Here. Madame Kira Maxwell. Present. Ms. Fernandez. Here. Let's see. All right. I see Mr. DiLoretto. Yes. Thank you. Hello. All right. Okie doke. Um, so we, the first item on the agenda is public comment. We have um, 15 minutes for public comment and we have 11 people who signed up. So, um, Everybody will be able to speak for two minutes and I am gonna use a timer um, and um, we'll, we'll be cutting you off at two minutes because um, that's how we've got to do this. So uh, as a matter of policy, the school committee does not respond to public comment. Um, and I did get a couple of uh, questions today from the community about uh, controlling the content of the comment and having it relating only to the high school, which is not what we do. So we, people can come and make comments about uh, whatever they want. So um, the first, let me find her. If you are somebody who has signed up for public comment in advance and you can raise your hand, it brings your name up 
to the top and it makes it easier for us to call on you. Um, so I don't, uh, Ms. Cubeta, uh, Cubeta, I don't see her yet in the list. So we'll come back to her when we see her. I just don't see her down here either. All right, so we're gonna come back to her and I'm gonna promote um, Ms. Morrison. And after Ms. Morrison will be Ms. Uh, Lisa Robinson. So we'll get you queued up too. I don't see you yet either. And after Ms. Robinson will be Ms. Lisa Sturma. Uh, so um, Ms. Morrison, can we see you? I'm looking for you. There you are. Okay. All right, Ms. Morrison, can you hear us? We can't hear you if you're talking. So you may need to unmute. So Ms. Morrison, we can't hear you. I'm not sure if you're trying to talk because I, I can't see you. All right, let me, let's keep you as a panelist here and then um, I'll, come, I'll come back to you. How about that? Um, Ms. Robinson, I don't see on the list. Let's see. All right, and Lisa Sturzma, I also do not see. All right, Mr. Holler, I'm gonna promote you. And after Mr. Holler is Ms. Amat. So I'm gonna go ahead and promote you at the same time. And then we'll see, we need to figure out how we can hear from, um, Ms. Morrison, I'm not sure how we're gonna get her unmuted, but we'll get there. Um, so Mr. Holler, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great, all right, good evening. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the committee for all the hard work that you've been putting into this challenging year. Uh, it's definitely not going unnoticed and for that we are very grateful. I'm the father of a first grader at Thompson who is in the hybrid model. And I don't need to go into detail about how much of a struggle the remote days have been for the children, the parents, the teachers, uh, as you're well aware. I am, however, encouraged by the fact that there's increasing committee support to get our youngest kids safely back in school full time. Now, there are many factors that must be considered to achieve this, but what I'm here uh, to say today is that we cannot solely depend on the vaccine in order to implement these changes. I'm a research scientist and I'm very excited about the data that is coming out surrounding the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines, but there are still unknowns surrounding transmission even with a vaccine. We also know that there are gonna be challenges in the rollout process and getting those vaccines into our school system. Uh, for example, Governor Baker just released a timeline indicating that K through 12 teachers will be in phase two, which is expected to occur between February and April, 2021. This is assuming that everything goes according to plan with distribution and the willingness of the public to receive the vaccine. But if we wait for this phase two rollout to get our youngest learners back in school full time, then our children will have been receiving inadequate education for a full year. And that is a terrible failure of our public school system. As far as timeline for vaccinating our children, currently no kids under the age of 12 have received a vaccine in clinical trials. Given the timelines needed to carry out safety and efficacy trials for the youngest children, they may not be vaccinated until late 2021 at the earliest. What we do know is that the youngest children are not major transmitters or severely affected by this virus. This has even been stated multiple times by Dr. Bodhi that our schools are not where transmission is occurring. Therefore, waiting on a vaccination of the student body is simply not an option. So now is the time to come up with a plan for elementary kids to have full in-school or remote, or remote choice with or without wide distribution of the vaccine to get our youngest learners uh, the education they need and deserve. 
Like everyone else, I'm concerned with the current virus surge, but this shouldn't keep us from moving forward with specific plans and concrete deadlines because we know this will take some time. We saw how this played out over the summer, but we are better informed and prepared now. So I look forward to hearing what options are proposed and I will certainly help the committee and the schools in any way that I can moving forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Holler. Um, I see Ms. Uh, Cubetta. So um, can you hear yes. us? Can you hear me? We can, yes. Oh, yes. great, okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm grateful for the chance to speak to you. Elizabeth Holman is not ready to be our superintendent. She has had limited teaching and even more limited leadership experience. Her impressive accomplishments vis-a-vis -vis equity and diversity and collaboration have all been accomplished by Dr. Greer as well. In comparison, Dr. Greer is a dream candidate. She is more than qualified to lead our schools. She has just led Sharon's high school rebuild, which could not be more relevant to Arlington right now. Our next leader will be arriving in the middle of our rebuild of our, our, our high school. She has the negotiating skills and knowledge of town governance and finance that will be required to see the rebuild through to completion. Dr. Greer enjoyed teaching and then leading special, in special education for over 10 years. She was so talented at it that she was recruited from Nashville by the superintendent of Cambridge to improve the teaching of special ed in our neighboring city. After three, after three and a half years as assistant superintendent, her boss endorsed her for the superintendency of Sharon. I would like you to consider remarks published in the Cambridge Day in January of 2017, when Dr. Greer had just been chosen to be Sharon's superintendent. Quote, before her hire, complaints about special the special education department by families were legion. But with Greer, the tone has changed dramatically. Almost overnight, the various special ed advisory council members appeared before Cambridge's school committee as fans of her work. Under her leadership, more progress has been made than has been made for many, many years. Superintendent Kenneth Salem said, Dr. Greer has been a tremendous part of our team, bringing her strength, vision, and leadership. Salem called the shift to, in her approach a sea change, one that we want to continue. We are committing to building on her successes. How does Elizabeth Holman top that record of achievement in your minds? Is not special ed a major concern in Arlington? As witnessed by the previous speaker, it is natural we, I'm sorry. It is I need you to wrap up because you're okay. trying to wrap. Thank you. So it, is, you it, is natural, it, is, it is natural to be attracted to people who are like you. Everyone is. I think some of you see yourselves in Dr. Holman. Fine. But this affinity leads to narrow thinking and preferring the familiar. You must make a professional, not a personal choice of superintendent. Dr. Martin Luther King wisely said, Change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. Dr. King would want me to speak up now about the mud of complacency and denial in which you, the school committee, appears to be mired. You shy away from the chance to be fair and bold and on the right side of history. You feel comfortable in maintaining the status quo in a town that begs you to do better. Please do not vote in Hogan tonight, Holman tonight. Each of you, please muster the courage and humility to admit you may have rushed to judgment. Open a window. Oh, Cubeta, and, I, I really need you to finish up. Okay, I, this is my last sentence. I'm in the middle of my last sentence, I promise. Um, open a window and let fresh air in to re-examine and weigh your choices as lots of citizens are asking you to do. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, Ms. Morrison, you're next, and it didn't work very well when I promoted you to a panelist for whatever reason. I'm going to try to allow you to talk just as a participant, and let's see if we can hear you um, that way. 
Are you able to hear me now? We can, yes. I'm sorry about that. We can hear you very well. Thank you. Go ahead. That's, that's all right. No problem. Um, geez, I, I want to thank uh, Karen Fitzgerald for, for keeping me posted uh, on this meeting. Uh, my concern this evening is uh, similar to what Ms. Kubeda has brought to your attention. It is the um, Arlington School Committee uh, overlooking the appointment of candidate uh, Dr. Greer for the position of superintendent of the Arlington Public Schools. I'm not going to uh, repeat all of the uh, accolades that uh, Ms. Kubeda has brought to your attention, only to say that by far she has more experience as a um, assistant superintendent and a uh, superintendent. But my concern is, I mean, I've, I've been a homeowner in Arlington for 50 years. I've served on several committees, but as, as a, a person that volunteers to serve on the superintendent's diversity advisory committee, since uh, Superintendent Walter Devine, that's quite a while ago, I have to say that at this point in time, the actions of this school committee have, it has less, left me stymied, I'm disappointed, I'm agitated. I want to know what was the thought process that, that this uh, body used to overlook um, Dr. Greer? What was the thought process? I know some of us have been admonished by the fact that we don't hire people because they are black because of their race. And I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to hire a person who is more than qualified and that is able to, not, not a person that has potential, but a person that has a proven track record. So, I, I, you know, I regret that I feel this way about the Allenton uh, School Committee, but um, I have to say that the committee has displayed in this regard, the typical unconscious bias that you didn't have the courage to envision two African-Americans, the superintendent and the assistant superintendent in positions of policymaking my, my argument is not with Dr. Holman as an individual. It's with my, my school committee. So Ms. And Morris, I do need you to just I finish. Just, I, I, just want, I just want to say, uh, say to the young lady in the, in the committee that I'm, I'm, I'm just devastated and upset by this decision by the school committee. So as Dr. King has said, and you can work with this tonight, it's never too late to do the right thing. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak and greetings to all the Allington residents who are beginning to celebrate Hanukkah. Good night. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Um, I still don't see Lisa Robinson in the attendees list. Ms. Robinson, if you are here, if you could raise your hand so you will come to the top of the list. Um, and I also don't see Ms. Um, Sturma who signed up, also signed up in advance to speak. So if you are also here, please also raise your hand so that we can find you. Um, Ms. Uh, Amat, you can go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Excellent. Good evening, everybody. I'm here to talk about a full in-person option for the elementary schools. And I wanna make a few salient points. The first is that coronavirus is not going away anytime soon. Even the vaccine will not be a silver bullet. We need to learn to live with this virus by taking precautions and continuing with the essentials of our, the essential tasks of our lives. That includes above all else, the education of our children. Second point, studies have shown that kids under 10 do not contract or spread the virus or get as sick from the virus as adults. This increases somewhat in middle school and then high school, college, and then adults. Uh, and it's both biological and behavioral. They don't understand why they don't spread, kids don't spread it at the same rate, but we do know that 
the elementary school kids are a, among the best mask wearers of our population. They police their friends and they scoff at adults who are not wearing masks. Evidence shows that elementary school kids can safely attend school in person without the risk of spreading coronavirus in the school or the community. Third point, the youngest kids need the most full-time in-person learning with their teachers. We're not talking about missing out on calculus or Russian lit. We're talking about reading, writing, and arithmetic. These are the fundamental building blocks of their learning. They need the class classroom structure, the peer group to help them focus, and the teacher to guide them. They cannot adequately learn via Zoom or independently. Fourth point. Teachers are overworked in the hybrid model. They have to teach in three different modes, in person, via Zoom, and planning remote assignments for home. I know they put a lot of extra time into doing all of this for our kids while still being acutely aware of the fact that it's not as good. This is not what they signed up for when they decided to become teachers. They want to be with the kids and they want to teach them in the most effective way possible and that's in the classroom. You, you said so yourself that you had a hard time getting enough teachers to sign up for the remote academy uh, in the K through eight uh, group. Most teachers want to be in school and those that don't are self selecting out. Fifth point, we're quickly approaching I need you to just wrap up. Thank okay. We're quickly approaching uh, a full year of third rate education for our kids. And I implore you to offer a full in-person option for the elementary schools starting Monday, January 4th, 2021. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Martin and then um, Ms. Dre. So Mr. Martin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tim Martin. I'm an English teacher at the high school. I wanted to let you know how positive the experience of remote teaching has been for me, and I believe for my students. It goes without saying that I would prefer a world without the pandemic, but as long as this is the state in which we find ourselves, remote classes are the closest approximation of a regular classroom available to us. I'm currently teaching three sections of AP Language and Composition, a high-level cor English course for juniors. Attendance has been very good. Participation is generally very high. And other than a few hiccups inevitable to learning new processes, the transition to remote classes has been smooth and we've been able to cover a lot of ground. In classes held over Zoom, I am able to reproduce many of the most important elements of in-person teaching. Elements that would be effectively impossible in a socially distant classroom with everyone wearing masks. In my current remote classroom, I frequently place the students into breakout rooms to have small group discussions with each other. When students have gathered their thoughts in small group of their peers, they are often able to voice their opinions more confidently when class reconvenes. Breakout rooms are, uh, also enable my more introverted students to participate in discussions. When my students are working on an essay, I usually have a class or two where they are in individual breakout rooms so they can invite me to the room if they have questions or want to discuss their writing without their classmates overhearing. Again, this mimics precisely a useful technique from a regular classroom when students call me over to ask me a question privately. In addition to the straight pedagogical utility of various features available on Zoom, the platform also allows the recognition of facial expressions and voice modulation vital to effective communication in a way that would be much more difficult from behind a mask. Finally, and arguably most importantly, one of the most surprisingly positive elements of remote learning has been the utterly disarming cameos by everyone's pets. It sounds like a joke, but if the school committee is interested in the social emotional learning of Arlington students, it would be hard pressed to find a more pure moment of unfeigned engagement and group bonding than when someone's cat or dog decides they're ready for their close up now. I don't downplay the challenges everyone is facing in this brand new medium, but my overall assessment of remote learning so far is that it has been overwhelmingly positive, especially in contrast to the alternatives. Thank you for your time. Thank you, um, Ms. Dre. Good evening, thank you. I'm here again to ask the school committee to do their job. From September and right up to today, 
it feels like you've blindly accepted the administration's vague statements about what can and can't happen without asking them to show the data or the work to back up those statements. In the presentation last week, the slide about hybrid models uses the phrase requiring significant staffing and significantly change class offerings five times. But no one can tell me what that specifically means. What does significantly change class offerings mean? How many classes? Which ones? Are they core classes? Are they electives? And why those classes? And the same for significant staffing. How many staff equals significant staffing? And are they teachers? Are they assistants? Are they aides? Which departments are they in? Are they AP teachers, honor teachers, core, you know, um, A and B teachers? There's no details. You've allowed the administration to use this vague and scary language and sort of threat, like significant, without asking for an explanation or providing any details of what it actually means. And now since the last meeting, I'm being told that no honors or AP classes can be offered in the two cohort model. This is brand new information. And again, no one can explain to me why that is. Are you going to accept that statement and not ask for the details behind it? The process, the work that led up to that decision? Because it seems unfathomable to me that a school can simply say that no one who comes in person will be able to take an honors or an AP class and not be able to explain why. And not only that, it is inequitable and it's a violation of students' rights to a free and appropriate education. Your decisions should be driven by clear, accurate data. So I ask you to not vote on next semester's hybrid model until you have that data. And if the high school administration cannot figure out how to get that data or articulate their process, then hire someone who can help them because we are running out of time. And I ask you not to accept any hybrid model that is not flexible to move towards more in-person learning in the spring. The vaccine is coming and teachers will be vaccinated from mid-February to mid-April. There is a lot of school left and it would be a travesty if the teachers are vaccinated and our kids are still at home in front of a computer because the school committee did not choose a plan that was flexible. And just to respond to Mr. Martin, I'm not saying that remote learning isn't academically successful. I'm saying it's not enough and it doesn't it doesn't achieve the social emotional needs of many of our kids who are struggling. Um, and so for that reason, I'd like you to consider, I'd like you to bring our kids back to school. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Roth. Good evening. Can you hear me? Sure can. Thank you. Go Thank ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joshua Roth. I am an Arlington resident. My kids went to Arlington Public Schools, and I am a sixth year teacher at Arlington High School. I thank you for this opportunity, and I will try to be brief. I want to uh, issue three thanks and expressions of gratitude, and then a modest request. First, uh, to the school committee and administrators, uh, to Ms. Fitzgerald, to all the people who are putting in great time and effort and psychic energy to helping us find a path forward, whatever that path may be. Thank you very much. I also um, was touched hearing the last two meetings and listening sessions um, by the expressions of support from parents. And this came uh, regardless of uh, whatever uh, model of um, future high school operations the parents favored. Uh, they were very generous uh, with their support and uh, their thanks, and it means a lot. Um, but most of all, I want to uh, thank uh, my students and uh, by extension, the other students at Arlington High School. Uh, without exception, they've been uh, generous, uh, tolerant of our um, technology stumbles. And um, I believe uh, really kind and accepting of each other in a moment of duress. And um, it's, uh, for me, without any doubt, the highlight of this school year. I want to just ask that as you consider a path forward for Arlington High School, um, uh, bearing a, a couple things in mind. One is that uh, any 
transitions that require the teachers to, for the second time in one year, um, completely tear up all that they have built at a uh, great time and expense in the way of lesson plans uh, will uh, be to the potential detriment of um, students in the community. The second is to consider when you look at schedules, the possible impacts on special needs students who thrive on routine. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Um, the next person is Ms. Donnett, followed by Ms. Skazensky. Just a note, if Ms. Robinson or Ms. Um, Sturma are here and can raise your hand, um, but if I don't see you before um, Ms. Skazensky is done, then we won't be able to call on you tonight. So um, Ms. Donnett, uh, can, you, can you say hello so that we can make sure we can hear you? Hello. Hi. Okay, great. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm a, a member of the community. I'm a parent of an eighth grader in Arlington. Um, I actually am participating in the diversion and inclusion group for the middle school. Um, I wanted to speak uh, again um, about the important process of selection of the superintendent, um, especially be between the, the selection between the two finalists. And I want to say that I spend many hours um, reading all information available publicly, as well as attending all the uh, all meetings open to the community. Um, I uh, know that there were strong uh, consensus in areas where actually Dr. Greer definitely shown experience and proficiency. That includes uh, the main focuses that were required by the community on uh, experience in special education, issues of cultural diversity, uh, and more. I'm trying to be uh, very brief here, so uh, for the sake of time, but Dr. Cubeda and Dr. Uh, Dr. Mor Ms. Morrison, or Dr. Morrison, uh, were awesome describing all the particular um, characteristics uh, in the previous uh, presentation, so that makes it easier for me. Um, I uh, more than agree because my feedback that I submitted uh, pretty much reads the same as the, uh, Mr. Heiner said in the meeting where uh, he said that uh, Arlington requires experience and not on the job training and an in innovative leader who will make tough decisions in the best interest of all children of Arlington, especially those who need a hire. And we need a candidate that will hit the ground running and Dr. Greer seems to be responding perfectly to that description to him and to me too. So um, I was underwhelmed when um, on the 24th, this committee rushed to make a final decision. Uh, and even though there was no unanimity and um, Dr. Heiner uh, ended up turning his, his decision at the end to vote uh, together with the other member committees, but um, uh, one of the members who vote against uh, actually requested the same things I was um, I would have requested, and I see um, one would be the technical issues uh, that prevented Dr. Guerra to have a proper session um, with the town officers, and also there was a feedback a survey, but there was no clear deadline. Um, so also the 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 in, and interview with the second candidate, with, with Dr. Hellman actually uh, took some time to be posted. And even though uh, you, you can say um, there were similar um, feedback provided by both, uh, I myself waited until I could see I, both. I need you to wrap up. Yes. So I want to say that I um, found out about the petition by the MLK com committee, which I, I realized uh, Ms. Cubeda, Ms. Morrison, who spoke before, were part of this um, writing this um, petition. I just checked last time I checked, I think it had like 120 signatures. And it says to um, reconsider the decision and re-examine um, for a chance to give Dr. Greer um to the chance to speak with the representatives that she didn't have and maybe some side visits and all the things that were skipped and rushed and while this would be kind of strange uh, to set back now but well this was forced by the fact that uh this the school committee rushed to make the decision it wouldn't happen if you would have 
taken the time to make the decision um, more uh, after examining as much of the evidence. And while we vote you to represent us, I feel, and that's going to be my last sentence, I, I was underwhelmed when I heard that somebody thought like they um, can make decisions for us because they are nominated members elected. But well, when I vote, I, I care that I feel that person will represent me if, if needed, but I also care that the representative is going to be waiting for the feedback from us, the people, and then uh, collecting as much evidence to represent the people, the community that uh, they should be representing, you should be representing. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kaczynski? Hello, can you hear me? Thank you. So thank you for your time. So I'm here tonight um, because although Arlington High School has some amazing teachers, including Mr. Martin and Mr. Roth, a lot of Arlington's teens, uh, including my son, are struggling academically and are suffering with isolation in the fully remote model at Arlington High School. Our students deserve the safe and comprehensive two cohort hybrid model that was adopted by the school committee in the fall. The same model that's being used safely across Arlington for grades K through eight. Some of the speakers at Monday's uh, listening session who advocated for staying all remote for the entire school year are justifiably worried about the winter COVID surge. But the school committee's task is to direct a plan for the spring semester, which doesn't start until mid-February and will take us all the way through June. We need to be thinking now about what we can deliver for our students in the spring. Many of the all remote advocates seem to forget that we already have a full two cohort hybrid model in all of Arlington's other schools. Forcing the high school to remain all remote as a public health measure while allowing the other schools to continue two days per week of in-person learning is both inequitable and nonsensical. Families who need or want an all remote program should be able to choose that option, but their choice shouldn't dictate the other families who don't currently have the option to choose a different model. I urge the school committee not to decide about the spring semester based on the inadequate survey data that we currently have that we got from AHS. Instead, the committee needs to push the administration to pursue all avenues for supplemental spaces and reasonable course offer and trade-offs. And more importantly, to show their work by reporting out clearly on what the trade-offs would look like. And, and by that, I mean, show us the data, please. Rather than making vague statements about the elimination of AP courses and honors uh, courses and electives. Specifically, the administration should not tell us we would lose all APs and honor courses in a hybrid model without showing strong data to support that. I say to the school committee, please say no to all three recent hybrid models and instead support a motion directing the superintendent to do further research on or move directly to implement the two cohort hybrid model at AHS for the spring semester. In my opinion, this is the only way to help our students get the education and the mental health back on track. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kaczynski. And I don't see um, Ms. Robinson or Ms. Sturma um, on the list. So um, the first item on the agenda is the, um, the Monotomy Hunter image retirement. Um, and so there is a document in Novus for the committee that Ms. Baldwin and some of her student um, colleagues uh, prepared for us, which was great. Um, and so I wanted to give her a couple of minutes to explain to us um, a little bit about where this came from and uh, what their requests are. So Ms. Baldwin, go ahead. Hello everyone, um, I'm Louisa Baldwin. I'm a senior at Arlington High School and I'm also the chair of the Arlington High School Inclusion and Diversity Committee. Um, a project that the Inclusion and Diversity Committee has been pursuing since the summer before this school year has been um, to investigate and, and do as we see it with the Monotomy Hunter image that has been an integrated part of the Arlington High School and Arlington Public Schools community for decades. We researched the history of the image, we researched the history of the statue that the image is based on, and we talked with many Native American voices about how about the image being used in a school context. So after conducting all of that um, research with the help of the Arlington High School administration, the Arlington 
Human Rights Commission and the Cyrus Dallin Museum um, and multiple Native American organizations in the area. We came to the conclusion that um, when being used in a school context, Native American imagery um, is offensive towards the Native American community. And we believe that the Arlington Public Schools is better than this and that we can be a community who doesn't feel the need to tear down a minority group just so that we can have a specific image on our basketball jerseys. We feel that though you can contextualize the statue, which the image is based off of, and Cyrus Dallin's history as an artist, you cannot contextualize reproducing that image thousands of times onto countless different pieces of merchandise to be sold to children and parents in the Arlington community. Um, so we have three motions in our proposal. Um, the first of which is to retire all usage of the Monotony Hunter in Arlington Public Schools and to remove it from where it currently stands in all forms. Um, and the second two concern something called a land acknowledgement. So land acknowledgements are a very easy um, and respectful way to acknowledge the harm done to the Native American community by colonizers over the past centuries. Um, all it is is a brief spoken and more drawn out written statement that acknowledges the fact that we are on stolen land and that we know who we stole the land from and we acknowledge their history and that they are still present today. So included in the document is an example text of a land acknowledgement that was written for a panel that um, the Arlington Human Rights Commission helped facilitate um, surrounding the Monotony Hunter. Um, the first sentence of which can serve as the brief spoken piece of a land acknowledgement. So our two motions around that are to adopt um, the written land acknowledgement to appear on Arlington Public School buildings and on Arlington Public School websites. And to adopt the brief spoken land acknowledgement to be used at um, important public forum events, such as school committee meetings. Thank you, Ms. Baldwin. Um, so I wanna give the, uh, I see Dr. Janger is here too, but I think um, Ms. Baldwin is well able to address um, our questions. And so I wanna give the committee a chance to um, to ask questions and then uh, see where we're at with this. So Ms. Exton, did you have any questions? I don't have any questions. I just wanna say that I um, appreciate all of the work and thoughtfulness that went into this, um, this motion and your work um, to make this happen and communicating with the administration and um, your peers. Um, and I appreciate all of that. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Curtin. Great, thank you. Yes, I echo um, Ms. Exton's uh, thanks for, for this report. Um, I was just a little bit confused by the document that we have. There's only one uh, land acknowledgement that I see. There isn't a separate spoken one. Is there a different so, document? Um, the first sentence of the written, it's in bold text, um, is would be the brief version of the land acknowledgement. Okay, and the motion is to to. Well, I think we we need to write the motion, right? Okay. I, I think we're going to need to come up with the motion, and I would suggest actually that we do these separately. So I yeah, so I, mean, I think. Uh, and just because our regular process is policies go to the policy committee first. Um, you know, I do think as far as we've already discussed the, the, the image and retiring that, and I'd be happy to entertain a motion to do that, uh, to support a motion to do that. But the, the land acknowledgement is a new thing that this is the first time it's come to us. So I, I do think there are certain policy implications that we need to think about um, you know, where that will be displayed. Um, I think we can recommend that speakers say, say it, but I don't think we can require speakers to say it. I mean, we, I guess legally we can, but we've never done anything like that before. So um, I think that needs more work and I'd be happy to have the policy committee review that part. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'm, I appreciate the work uh, I have also have questions about the land acknowledgement and would like to hear 
more discussion of it policy would be a good place but i also feel that it's more of something to me that feels on a town level and that then we would be acting as part of the town um, because it's not just our buildings it, it's the whole town that that you're really talking about um so uh yeah i would prefer that go to policy um for the monotony hunter i'm i'm trying to remember how we left it when we talked about it before if there was going to be any other I, i'm i'm a, i'm in agreement that we needed to retire the usage um i just I remember we were talking about this and I don't remember exactly what we decided at that point. That's all. Great. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, Ms. Baldwin, thanks very much for the presentation and for coming to the school committee with prepared motions. That's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I echo what my colleagues have said. I support uh, the decision on the uh, Monotomy Hunter and I agree with Mr. Cardin that we probably have to send this to the uh, policies and procedures subcommittee. Can you describe, um, Ms. Baldwin, if there was any opposition to this uh, move within the school and what students who might've had a different opinion thought? So um, in the administration that we had direct contact with, there was no opposition. I think that um, these adults who have been a part of the school community for years and years um, realize the full effects of that this image on the culture of the school um, and how the change is a long time coming and is needed. Um, and we were very fortunate to have that support um, while pursuing our work as a student group. Um, in terms of students, we have had conversations with many students. Um, our research team well, so the Inclusion and Diversity Committee encompasses students from the Student Council, the Gender Sexuality Alliance, the Young Feminist Alliance, the Black Student Union, and Best Buddies um, at Arlington High School. So all of those student groups are represented in our committee and our project. We are also working with members of the Anti-Racism Working Group on the project. Um, and we have also been in contact with some history teachers, um, mainly the United States history teachers at Arlington High School, and we helped facilitate um, a reverse field trip with um, one of those teachers and our classes in which we went to the town gardens where the statue of the Monotony Hunter sits and we just had um, these long conversations with those students, I believe they were all sophomores, um, about the statue and what they think. Um, we did not encounter any direct opposition to making the change. I think that um, we are fortunate to live in a town with teachers who care about um, teaching all of the voices in history to their students and students who care enough to learn about all of those voices and be conscious of them. Thank you. Mr. Shukman. Yeah, thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, yeah, the. Uh, it's my understanding that at present we're working towards uh, finding a new uh, image and logo for the high school and for our sports teams. So um, if there's a further motion that would be required, uh, I, I think that the committee can certainly think about this, but I think we're already on that road with the support of the committee and actually through the active direction of the committee. The uh, land statement I, I think is is brilliant I'm, I'm i'm happy to see it before us but as my colleagues have stated we need to actually codify that in policy as to what will be said and when it would be said and how it would be posted so that uh, it is an appropriate thing to advance to the policies committee but thank you for doing this this is really great work Mr. Hainer. Thank you, Ms. Baldwin. Uh, I'm excited uh, to, for your presentation. I'm also uh, willing to state that I will support you in any elected office you seek in the future. Your articulation and your organization is just phenomenal. Uh, I would ask the chair if it would be appropriate to entertain a motion at this time with regarding uh, retiring uh, the image. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Hainer. 
I shall move to uh, if, Ms. Baldwin, could you give us the language you gave us before? Um, yes. To retire the usage of the Monotony Hunter image completely from the Arlington Public Schools community and to remove it from where it stands currently in all forms. I so move. Thank you. Second. Um, so discussion on this, and I'm going to uh, take the chance to do my discussion now, and then I'm happy if anybody else wants to raise their hand to further discuss, I'm happy to call on you as well. Um, this was uh, very impressively put together and brought to us. Um, I did want to let the community know a couple of things. Um, and this is, these are things that Ms. Baldwin and I had a chance to discuss um, before tonight. The, uh, the, the hunter seal or the imagery is in the middle of Pierce Field at the high school. Um, and that is a location that will require significant investment to resurface and repaint. I'm, I'm not a field person, but it, it will take a significant investment to resurface and repaint that field. And it is not up to be done for another, I believe, four to five years. Um, so that's that in, in that location, I think it is possible that we may have it for longer. Um, but uh, Ms. Baldwin, as part of the work that her and her team did, they gave us um, a sense of where else the um, the uh, seal is used, which was very helpful, um, as well as a plan. And it sounds like it's generally pretty straightforward. Um, I also will say that there are, I've looked around online and there are a lot of websites that have taken this iconography and have used it on swag and booster apparel that is outside of the auspices of the Arlington Public Schools. And I think it, it could take a while to get it removed um, from there, but, um, other than that, you know, I think that this is um, something that um, has been really impressively put together and brought forward. And um, so I am looking forward to supporting this motion. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on this particular motion again? Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. Just in terms of the uh, image and the uh football field, yeah, that is going to be an expensive thing. And I think we can fundraise when we have a replacement image that we'd like to place there. So I would urge uh, the school community to work as quickly as they can to devise uh, a new image that we could use as a replacement. Great. Anybody else? All right. So let's vote on the, uh, Mr. Cardin. Thanks. So I just was wondering if we need to modify the motion just to allow for the field to remain as is until we can either unraise or, or go through the regular cycle. Okay. Mr. Thielman? Yeah, I would suggest, so just add a <clears throat> comma and then um, with the understanding that uh, it will take time to remove it from the from the football field. So does that work for you, Mr. Hainer? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right. Dr. Janger. So I didn't want to say much because the students have done such a fabulous idea, but I I did want to say that one of the things that's been really positive about this is that their plan and the plan with the Human Rights Commission with the Dallin Museum, with the Massachusetts Center for Native American Awareness, the United American Native, um, Indian Native American, uh, United American Indians of New England, and um, our contacts at the uh, Ponkapog tribe. Um, that whole conversation around the, the panel that was held is to keep this going forward, right? That the work doesn't end for the students and the work they're doing with removing the image, but then educating themselves. So the work they're doing going forward is really exciting. The Dallin Museum is working to contextualize the sculpture itself to think about the way in which that image is being used in the community. And there was a question and I just wanted to reply to it in terms of responses in the community. When the letter went out in July, initially um, you know, asking for a moratorium on the use while we had this conversation, the main concern that I got was people who were concerned about the sculpture and the, um, the history of Cyrus Dallin. 
Um, whereas there was a real distinction between that and the use of the symbol in the school. So I think the students and all the folks that have had the conversations have done a really nice job of dividing and educating people about that. So I just wanted to give huge points to the students in terms of really doing the work in a thoughtful way. Um, it's a lot of fun when that happens uh, and watch them do that. And I'm really impressed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. So first, I will be voting for this motion, but I think we would be remiss if we did not acknowledge that there are a lot of alumni who I think may in some respects be disappointed or feel sadness because this is what, you know, it, it, it's their high school. And now not only are, are we knocking down the old building, but we're kind of taking away a picture. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. And I'm not saying we're not doing this for the right reasons, but that there is going to be some um, angst and, and sadness in the community, especially among older alumni. And I think it'd be good to, as, as we go forward that there's good messaging about why it was done and that a new mascot is on the way. Um, and just acknowledgement that this is something rightly or wrongly that, that there will be some sadness about. Dr. Jenger. Well, I agree with that 100%. And I'm going to count on um, the student committee to do the work because I think they're really on top of it. I did want to mention, though, that we've actually been in conversation and correspondence with uh, the woman who drew the seal as it is used and with uh, Bill Grannon, who was um, the select board member who actually initially um, authorized the creation of that seal. So they've been involved and we're working to involve them in the conversation. All right, anybody else? Okay, Ms. Exton. Yes. Arden. Uh, so motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Exton. Uh, Ms. Exton on retirement of the Monotomy Hunter image and uh, an acknowledgement that we've got uh, it's going to take a little while to deal with Pierce Field. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Dr. Alice Nampy. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Swickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. I am also yes. So um, the and the other piece of this, um, I guess I would be looking for a motion um, so that I think it's important that we um, uh, signal to the students that we uh, want to move forward with looking at the idea of a land use acknowledgement for the Arlington Public Schools. Um, and so I would be looking for a motion to send that to the policy subcommittee. Mr. So, so moved. Second. Um, discussion? All right, seeing none. Uh, Ms. Exton, go ahead. Um, I sort of have a question. Somebody suggested it um, being also about the town because it's not just the school that um, sits on this land. Um, is there separately from this motion referring to the policy committee a way to include the town in a broader conversation? I, we certainly could do so. Um, I'm obviously open to that. I would probably, my inclination would be to send it to policy and then go out from there with that ask, but um, Mr. Hainer. Uh, might uh, just turn around and invite uh, town representative, let them know what we're doing and invite them to the policy discussion. Dr. I think we could have some conversations on the town with the town side, just who do we think should own the own the bigger picture? You know, do they want to do two separate things? Do, or to me, it, it really feels more like it should be from the town and then all the different community committees come down, but we can discuss this in policy. All right, anybody else? All right, motion to uh, send the discussion of a land use acknowledgement in the Arlington Public Schools to the policy subcommittee motion by Mr. Schlickman. The second was by 
don't know. Mr. Hayner, super. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Alice Nampy. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Sickman. Yes. Mr. Hayner. Yes. I am also yes. Thank you so much, Ms. Baldwin. Um, please keep in touch if there's, um, we will certainly uh, connect with you and make sure that uh, you and your classmates know uh, when the policy subcommittee will meet about this and take this up. Mr. Schlickman is the chair of that subcommittee. So I will uh, pass your contact information along to him and I know that he will reach out when, um, when that meeting is scheduled. All right, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you so much. All right, the next item on our agenda are enrollment projections. Mr. Mason. Good evening, good evening. Um, Tonight, uh, you guys uh, hopefully have seen the report um, and projection, which uh, were included for your review. Uh, this report includes um, this year's current enrollment as uh, what we would call the October 1 report, uh, with nine, years, uh, nine prior years of actual enrollment. Um, and as you may already know, uh, you will see upon observation, um, Arlington Public Schools have seen substantial growth uh, from October 1st of 2011 to October 1st, 2019, um, which was a growth of about 1,252 students, uh, which was over 25.7% rate of the growth over that particular period. However, uh, this year is the first year we see a decline in enrollment after seeing those nine years of increase upon increases of enrollment. Um, the, the total enrollment uh, for October 1 report this year is 5,841 students. Um, and this is a decrease of 287 students from last year. Um, this brings us more in line to an enrollment level that we last seen in October 2017. Um, this substantial uh, re reduction is something that, you know, I've, we've talked about before. We are still currently analyzing um, the 287 students that have, are reflected in this report um, are, is a net uh, of the students that have left the district plus those that have entered uh, this year mainly from incoming kindergarten or other, other lower grade levels. Um, and currently on record, we have about 106 kindergarten students that enrolled from APS this year. Uh, uh, shown in our student information system based on that analysis that we're doing. Um, and in that data, we see about third, we have a, a understanding that are currently enrolled in private schools of those 100 students. And another a third has, will probably not return to Arlington because they have moved out uh, of the community. Um, and 15, 15 of the syllable students we know will return, they're being held back. Um, overall total numbers for the student, not just for the, for the kindergarten coming class, uh, is uh, unenrolled from the district was 259 that had moved out of the community. Um, these numbers were previously uh, provided to you um, in uh, a prior report that we're still uh, wrapping up. Um, 156 of those are been transferred to private schools to, be, to, for, your, to for your memory, and then 70 students are, are or over 70 of them have been considered uh, being homeschooled. And some are also enrolled in a virtual, another virtual program that's not part of Arlington Public Schools. Um, I just wanted to also kind of note that we, we, we were planning to select a vendor. Uh, we brought this up in last year on doing a 10 year projection. We've just selected a vendor to do that. Um, it's a subdivision of power schools. Uh, it's a co company called Decision Insight. Power Schools is our student information system. Uh, and they're gonna provide a demographic uh, study and enrollment projection for, for the district, which they're gonna do two different projections as a, a moderate and a conservative model. And they will also consider any uh, modeling with the pandemic in terms of the return of students, along with any uh, surveys that we're gonna do in internally. Um, also uh, included for you guys was uh, 
a, a prior projection. I thought it was important to, to remind you what the prior projection was before this year. Um, the, the decline affects the weighted average formula used to project enrollment. And this is the, the formula that we use to fund uh, Arlington Public Schools, it was agreed to with, with the town. Um, the, this decrease changes the projection where the year's, proje the year's projections changes uh, over, over last year, when you look at the four-year projection, five-year projection of nearly 800 students. So the, the, mo the most important, this, this is significant. And the reason why, this is the reason why we probably shouldn't use this year's enrollment as you, you may already know. That's because that it, it would cause this uh, big change. And we still probably have to provide the services to these students for those that do return to the district. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get closer to figuring out that, uh, that number. Uh, I just will open it up to any questions to the chair. Mr. Cardin and then Mr. Hainer. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that, I, I mean, I think we we need to come up with our sort of a revised estimate of the projection of the projections. Um, uh, you know, I think for 2021, that's going to be a lot of guesswork, um, you know, based on not guesswork, but piecing together the information we have about those 15 kindergarten students and the 70 homeschool students and the other information we have. Um, you can put people back in into, into the right years. Um, and come up with a, you know, a, a guess. Um, but then for the remaining years, I would, you know, maybe we can just discuss this offline, but I would go back to using the weighted averages that you have here in the second sheet, um, because it doesn't make sense to wait using, use, to put to this year's numbers into that formula at all, because it's such an anomaly. Um, uh, so we do expect that whatever we get back, we'll get back. And then in the out years, we're gonna to continue to grow because um, of the pipeline of kids. So it doesn't make sense to, 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 to bake this year's decline into the formula. So, we'll, we, but we need to figure that out. Thanks. Mr. Hainer. One of my concerns is on the kindergarten. When you talk about those that made an, uh, chose the option not to participate this year, we get kindergarten enrollment right up to, and sometimes even after school starts. So there may be a, a group of people out there that never even showed that they were interested in coming as the pandemic uh, increased in the later months. Just an observation. That kindergarten number may be bigger, much bigger than we thought. It may not be. Well, let me see. We are um, also analyzing the birth rates uh, data. Uh, we received some initial reports from the, the clerk's office and we're sifting, shift, sifting to that data and we'll provide update once I can get more solid information back to you. But that won't reflect anyone that's moved in here mm -hmm. after being born. Correct, it, it just would give us I, some kind of guide, ba baseline to the, to the correlation between the, the, the birth rate data to the enrollment from those prior years. That's what we're going to use the data for. Prior to you coming here, your a predecessor of yours used just that as the only basis. Mm -hmm. As one tool, that's great. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, I was going to um, schedule a budget subcommittee meeting next week. So I think this that would be this would, that would be a good place to take this up. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Schickman, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mason, for the report. Uh, yeah, the, the wild card on this is how many um, kindergarten kids were withheld this year who will be coming back next year. So I think that we need to be thinking about some sort of a policy or incentive or request out to the community to uh, look at indications of registration for next year so we have a handle on how many kindergarten sessions we're going to need. I think that, that uh, it's going to be a significant uh, issue for us. Agreed. Thank you. 
Um, so my only, the only thing that I would like to see at some point, and um, I thought that it was what was in the superintendent's report for tonight under class size, but um, that's just a breakdown um, by I think age and ethnicity. So um, I'm hoping for our meeting a week from tonight that we can get a class size report. Um, I, I know it needs to be redone based on that we have some remote classrooms that are in other schools, um, but I was hoping that we could get a look at that um, by next week if possible. Okay. Anybody else? All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Mason. Uh, the next item on the agenda are the fiscal year 2020 uh, Arlington High School, Audison Middle School and Gibbs budget needs. Um, so just so the community knows the way, this is um, part of our traditional uh, budget process. We're gonna actually have our second vote of the budget calendar here later on in our meeting this evening, uh, which will be exciting. And uh, we'll know exactly where we are at in uh, meeting our uh, calendaring needs, but uh, this is the part of the process where uh, we invite both the principals as well as our representatives from the um, the AEA, our teachers union, to come and share their um, budget requests. And we do it, the way that we do it here in Arlington is by level. Um, this is a time for principals and the AEA to come and uh, tell us what they think that they are going to need for uh, FY22. FY22 begins uh, in on uh, July 1 of 2021 and goes until July, well, till June 30th of 2022. So it totally makes sense. Um, and uh, the way that we do this is we we're, we're asking for things now. So this, I always say, this is the like pre new year, pre-holiday break time where people come and they ask for what they want and we all say we nod along and um, and then we come into January and February and March and that's where uh, it starts to get much trickier. Um, but this is this is a nice uh, this is a nice event tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I think unless the uh, principals object, I think we should go in chronological order. So starting with Madame Pierre Maxwell, followed by Mr. Meringer, and then finishing up with Dr. Janger, and then with the AEA, um, where we hear from Ms. Fernandez. So uh, I don't see any uh, objections. So Madame Pierre Maxwell, you can go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to wish a happy Hanukkah to anyone who's celebrating tonight and starting their uh, eight day, eight night celebration. So um, I wanna thank the school committee members for having me tonight to present a summary of where we are at Gibbs and what we would like for next year. So I'm happy to hear maybe everything's gonna be said yes to tonight. <laughs> and then maybe, <laughs> maybe some rethinking in February. Um, but so far um, I was reviewing over uh, last school year at this time, when former principal De Francisco presented to this school committee and say we were fully engaging in implementing our responsive classroom and that was well on the way and how well he was servicing the school. And I must report that responsive classroom has been really a, a great um, philosophy and framework for our school, which was timely implemented to help us uh, helping student transition the school year, uh, dealing with all the effects of COVID has had on our families. And uh, the framework really focused on cooperation, perseverance, academic mindset, so children can really stay the course even under difficult uh, conditions, uh, empathy, self-control, responsibilities, all these skills that our children especially needs today to be successful uh, doing school very differently differently than they were used to doing it. Um, also, we have had uh, the opportunity for a grant uh, found by us for the, by the uh, director of the SEL for Arlington Public School, uh, Miss Sarah Bird, that has uh, allowed us to give a COVID screening to all of our sixth graders to help us identify 
where the children uh, are social emotionally. And so over 95% of the children have taken uh, the COVID screener. And so I'm glad to report not too many of our kids or were identified as tier three, but in that case, those who were, we in communication with their families and we have a partnership with the AYCC and the interface to assist us in providing the appropriate services for those children. In addition to our school counselors and our social workers and all the other staff who are helping the classroom teachers to support our students. So, so far, so good. Uh, we just ended our first term and we are in the process of uh, taking a closer look at the children's academic performance to see where they are. Uh, over the next few weeks, we will be examining uh, the results and really think about what's going well and what can we do better to support our students moving into uh, the second terms and definitely see what can be improved as soon as we return from the winter break. Uh, so um, before I speak to what we really think we will need next year to support the school to continue the work that we're doing is that I want to put the caveat that uh, the elephant in the room is that we don't know if we're still going to be under this very specific restriction of the COVID. So uh, whatever estimation I'm giving tonight, as well put by Ms. Morgan, may really be changed by the time we get to mid-year uh, based on what our seven elementary school fifth graders uh, will be needed to really make that transition in an effective way at Gibbs School. So that said, uh, we're looking at next year needing a 0.3 world language uh, teacher in Spanish to really uh, balance uh, the, the need for, um, we have many students requesting Spanish as a language. So 0.3 was actually approved and added, but we have not been able to fill the position because of just not able to find a, a person for that point three. So that is still something we will need. We'll continue to look this year, but uh, if we're not successful, that's a position we hope to be able to uh, hire for next year. We're also looking at uh, one uh, full-time math coach interventionist anticipating to uh, be able to support many of our students who may be, it's really gonna be a, a question of equity next year, looking at what the students have received. As you know, uh, our students in a hybrid program are physically here two days uh, of the week and the other two days and a half at home. So we're anticipating some of our kiddos gonna have some very specific needs and we would like to be able to intervene timely to make sure that we are helping them being able to be successful uh, next year in the sixth grade. Uh, we're also asking for a, an additional uh, office assistant. Currently we have one at the Gibbs School uh, versus a 2.6 of that same position at the Audison. Um, our office assistant, Ms. Angelakis, she is fabulous but she is also just one person and servicing over 500 people if you count the students and we have a staff of about 77 people. And um, I'm grateful that uh, not being, a, I am a new principal to Arlington, but a, not a new principal. So I've been able to take on some of the res responsibilities typically an assistant will be doing. So we would very much appreciate to have someone else in the building to help assist with all the different um, with sensibilities a, a school this size need to take care of. And certainly COVID has added so many other procedural aspects of the work for myself and Ms. Salvatore, who is the assistant principal. So we definitely could use some assistant, not just ne next year, but also this school year. Um, we're looking at adding some more building subs uh, in, in the building. This is something that um, I did uh, look into even pre-COVID when I was giving the position in conversation with uh, Ms. Salvatore and, and Principal Di Francisco as I was transitioning because we really want to maximize Ms. Salvatore's time uh, working more on academic issues, supporting teachers, being in classroom versus spending a significant amount of time right now covering lunchtime and doing other tasks that we think will be better served um, if we had more building subs uh, helping us support the learning communities and doing coverage when teachers are out, uh, et cetera. Also helping monitoring uh, when we have a recess and, and these types of activities. And um, 
last but not least, also a school social worker, again, on the issue of how um, are our students coping uh, with this uh, current condition uh, under COVID, having to adjust to learning either fully at home or part-time in school. Uh, we're hoping that the children are resilient and we won't have too many tier two and tier three students. However, currently the school is being serviced by one social worker who's mainly servicing children who may have an individualized plan. And so therefore we are anticipating that our tier one students to remain tier one will need some special attention. So uh, that's the reason for asking that uh, 1.0 social worker. And Mr. Merringer and I have had conversation where we actually discuss sharing one extra. And, and I think that probably both school would need one to support what's going on in the individual buildings. Um, so these were uh, the staffing uh, priorities we, we have for next year. And then non-staffing priorities, um, they remain practically the same, which is fundings to support our MTSS and UDL training for all staff. Uh, the MTSS framework uh, embodied um, the just designing experiences where uh, teachers can really think of the whole students and having lessons that is proactively meeting the needs of all of our students. And so they do still need some significant training in that uh, every time they are thinking of creating lessons to think of the social, emotional, the academic and the behavioral all at once, but not just for our um, maybe uh, proficient or advanced students, but all students. So we feel that the staff can benefit from some more trainings there. And of course, uh, to continue to train any new staff members in responsive classroom and maintaining that training for our staff who have had received it, taking them to the next level to continue to do well uh, with the framework. Uh, we also uh, would like funding to um, get uh, further into project-based learning. The, the staff is still at an infancy stage in, in doing this work and also having the co-teaching model at Gibbs School where our uh, teacher liaison and the core classroom teachers are learning to collaborate together and servicing the students. So, um, and last but not least, certainly in the um, issue of equity, inclusion, and anti-racist, uh, which is uh, a work that we all know it's long-term work and difficult work. So we would like to have some uh, support for all these um, practices that we're currently using at the school and think is really uh, serving us well. And we would like to continue to use them at the Gibbs School. I appreciate your attention. I hope I didn't time myself, so hopefully I didn't take too long. Thank you so much. Thank if you, you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Great. Um, so I think we should do questions by level. I know I can't, I'm not going to be able to track the the social workers school to school. So uh, questions for uh, Madame Pierre Maxwell. Mr. Cardin. Thanks. So this might actually be for Mr. Spiegel, but uh, I always get confused about the difference between a school counselor and a social worker. And I know we have social workers that specifically fulfill needs on IEPs. And then I thought we had school counselors, which basically did social work uh, type services uh, in addition to helping with course selection and other things. So um, can, can someone explain uh, the difference for Ms. Elmer? So Fabian, would you like me to explain? Yes. <laughs> um, at the middle school level, the um, school counselors are um, social workers because there isn't a, you know, that formerly guidance counselor model at the middle school level. So for, um, the middle school level, they're used interchangeably as far as the title, but Rob, it would be hired under general ed um, uh, social worker. We have, we have more flexibility with the licensure for the school counselors. I mean, there's a school counselor licenses, which is what it's called now, which I believe they all have. And I think they also all have or have the school social worker school adjustment counselor license. Um, I think this is sort of more analogous to, there's a couple of positions at the high school that are general ed social workers that support students' social emotional needs, not necessarily under IEPs. And I think um, 
that's probably the need at the middle school as well that is being requested to have general ed social workers to really support social emotional and Mr. Maringer or Madam Pierre Maxwell can sort of uh, jump in as, as what the, the school counselors do is a lot of the scheduling, a lot of uh, 504 management, I think, and um, probably a lot of a longer list that I can name right now. But I think the social worker, I think that they're looking for is more specifically focused on social emotional counseling needs for under for any student, but it's a, it would be a general ed position. Yeah, can I can I actually speak to it since um, you know I, I'm looking to potentially share this position with uh, you know but um, so the idea right now the the setup is that we right now at the middle school at the Audison we have four school counselors um, traditionally you can think of almost um, a guidance counselor we divide those. Um, caseloads up pretty evenly. So we, they each have about 225 students that they're taking care of. They're doing anything from scheduling to help with issues of friendship. Sometimes they're doing some counseling, um, but they usually don't have like weekly counseling sessions that you would have on an IEP. And one of the difficulties that we're running into is we have two social workers, one for seventh grade and one for eighth grade, but they work almost exclusively with kids on IEPs. And one of the things that we're seeing is sometimes kids need more regular counseling than what we can really provide from school counseling, but we don't really have a place for those kids to go because the social workers who see kids routinely are only for kids on IEPs. And what we're really seeing is when kids suffer from anxiety or depression, or sometimes there's an event that happens and we would like them to meet with a social worker more regularly, the only way they can really access that is by getting an IEP. So we're seeing an increased number of parents looking for more social emotional help. And as a school, we're saying, well, um, we can kind of stop gap it a little bit by having you meet with a school counselor, but we don't really have much to offer you long term. And I think there's been a couple instances in which I think if we had had a regular, a general ed counselor, I think we could have probably um, just have them meet with the student instead of going through the IE process. So I think both Madame and I are worried about next year. We don't know what the social emotional impact is gonna look like, but we definitely wanna provide that level of support for kids who are in the general education um, program. So just to follow up, just to follow up, yeah. is it because the, the four school counselors don't have time in their schedules to see people regularly or because they don't have the skills needed to do that? They don't have the time. It's it it's a it's a time issue, not a skill issue. Um, but you'll have someone that has something that happens, and they're needing like weekly check-ins. So for sometimes it might be a shorter period for two or three weeks that they might need, you know coming in and daily counseling kids with school refusal and it might be more intensive counseling to get them in through the door or to deal with something that might have happened in their lives and then they're fine um but we're really finding that there's there's a, a group of people and i think this was even pro pre-covid for us at the middle school was it was a real gap because the school counselors they do have 225 kids on their caseload as in enrollment's going to go up, they're going to have 250. That's a lot of kids to kind of look after, parent phone calls, check in with kids, friends issues, changing schedules, um, trying to help them with their grades. They're busy seeing kids all day. And when you have that one or two students that all of a sudden walk through the door and they need to meet with someone for a half an hour every two or three days, um, I don't think we you know, can necessarily meet their needs. Okay, thanks, that's helpful. Okay. Um, and then my other, it, it's more of a point for Mr. Mason and, and, and Dr. Bodhi. I, I think for next year, I would suggest that we need to have sort of a, a category in our budget for recovery services. Um, things that we need, we think we, we're going to need for next year to recover, you know, assuming we're back in school, knock on wood, um, but, but uh, things that we need to recover from this year that might be one year only things and separate that out from things that we need 
going forward for regular enrollment growth or whatever, because I think those one-year things are gonna be easier to justify than funding other long-term initiatives right now. So I would definitely advocate for that. I mean, maybe something we can discuss at budget. Thank you. Anybody else for Madame Care Maxwell? Mr. Schickman, was that your hand? I'm sorry. Yeah, that was my hand. I, I don't know if this is specifically for Madame Pierre Maxwell or for Mr. Merringer, because we're on the topic of social workers, um, which is something I've advocated for for the, for the past several years. Um, maybe my experience as an urban district principal is substantively different than what we're experiencing in Arlington. And, and I'm willing to go and accept that as is, is a a hypothesis, but uh, a lot of the things that I've needed social workers for were for things that were not necessarily tied to an IEP because uh, family trauma and other things that have impact that require a social worker aren't limited to kids with IEPs. In fact, often happen to kids who don't. So I would think that one of the priorities would be to uh, add uh, social workers who are not targeted to uh, special ed and IEPs, but to the situational aspects of life that kids are confronting right now. And, and I'm sure that that's going to be uh, even more dramatic as we are returning from COVID. Um, and I think that's exactly the point, Mr. Schlickman, you, you, you're stating it exactly what we wanted to say. Uh, the current social worker at Gibbs School is servicing uh, children who already have an IEP. But currently with our two school counselors, we're noticing there's more work to do with our tier one students. And the way we're set up requires, it's a difficult, it's a different dynamic now to create small community and group with the students. So that in itself takes more time for those two persons to be able to make that happen for everyone. And we have other children who are being very affected. They don't really want to turn on their screen or they don't want to participate and the parents are not sure how to assist them. So there is a lot more work to be done with children who typically would have been tier one students, but now because of the different where they are um, dealing with this whole situation, we're seeing that we need more help for our regular ed population versus just children who may have been uh, officially identified. Thank you. I, I, I just couldn't run a school without a social worker who met with the general population. And, and I, I think this has to be a really huge priority going forward, especially because of the turmoil that we've experienced this year. Great, anybody else? So my my comment, and this can be, I, I won't repeat it, Mr. Merringer, because the, the example that I have heard have actually been at the Audison, but I'm sure that there are situations like this at the Gibbs as well, where there are students who are in the general education population, and you've spoken to it, who need, um, you know, uh, to have access to a social worker and, you know, your staff has agreed with the parents who have agreed, you know, they've all, they're, everybody's in agreement and there is literally not time to see them. And I think that the other excruciating issue with this that hasn't been touched on, and I would like to add it is that there is, there is not availability of people to work with children in this community, basically anywhere. Parents cannot get their kids in, even if they have private health insurance that will pay for it, um, and they are dogged about finding somebody to work with their kid, you literally cannot find a mental health professional with availability to work with children um, in the greater Boston area at this time. So um, to the extent that we can provide those services to students in our schools, um, I think it's really it's really critical because they're, they just are not available to people um, elsewhere. So um, anybody else on the Gibbs? Mr. Merringer, you're up. 
Thank you. Uh, so happy holidays to everyone. And um, I just wanted to briefly go over some budget requests here for the Audison. It is a little bit more of a difficult year to forecast, as we know, through enrollment increases, which we think will happen, but we're not really sure. Um, we don't know exactly some of the academic impact that this year will have on our students. And we don't know some of the social emotional effects that it will have on our students. We're trying to look at all these factors and come up with a uh, come up with requests for next year. The first request we'd like to make at the Audison is to have an extra half cluster or half learning community. So just to let you know, last year um, we had eight learning communities. We requested another half a learning community last spring. Um, it was graciously approved. So we were coming into this year with eight and a half during the summer because of needs of classroom space and the remote academy we moved up to nine learning communities we would like to keep those nine learning communities we think we'll have somewhere between 940 to probably 990 students we would like the learning community sizes to be anywhere between 105 and 110 we would like to keep class sizes a little bit smaller 21 um, to 22 kids and not go over that we think there's going to be more individual attention needed. So we're really looking for nine learning communities, which is an increasing um, to FTE. Um, I already talked a little bit about the uh, social worker. So we're looking to increase services there. We are also looking to increase um, a reading teacher. So currently right now, the Gibbs has three reading Teachers, we have two at the Audison. Um, looking at the amount of reading students right now at the Gibbs, there's 82 students, which is a much bigger group of students that will be entering into the Audison looking for reading support. It's something that Right now we have two reading teachers, but they have a very uh, busy caseload. And we think that that's gonna be busy next year again and increase in the future years. We're looking for a 0.2 math support teacher. We're just feeling that um, to get another class of math support um, as we increase enrollment. And then the last thing we are thinking is at the middle school, we do have study halls. And we're thinking right now, we'd like to get two instructional support specialists, which would be almost smaller tutors for kids to go to um, at study halls to get extra help. So in the high school, it's almost a, a learning center model. We're trying to look at the high school and kind of come up with a learning center model for those kids who aren't on IEPs, but need a little extra support in a smaller setting other than a study hall, which for us is usually run by a building sub. So those are really the um, requests that we're looking for at the Audison. Great questions or comments for Mr. Mason. I mean, for Mr. Mason, <laughs> Mr. Marincher. Mr. Mason, I'm sure you could take on running a middle school. I have no doubt, but. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Mr. Marincher. Uh, Mr. Hainer. I think Mr. Marringer would rather have the checkbook in his own hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else for Mr. Marringer? Dr. Al Snappy. This isn't really a question. It's more of a statement that I agree that this would next year would be the year to try and keep class sizes down, given everything that everyone's going to be dealing with coming back, hopefully. Um, so that's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Marringer. Dr. Linger. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I was remembering back to last year, this time when um, I thought that the big uh, struggle coming into this year was going to be a building project, which most of us aren't talking about very much. Um, and I think uh, Mr. Marringer was said it very well when he talked about the big characterization of this coming year is uncertainty. Um, so I try to, I'm going to try to be short and I'm going to try to keep it simple. Um, the things that have driven our enrollment growth over, I mean, our staffing growth, which is our main budget ask each year um, over the last years have been enrollment and continue to be enrollment. 
but we had a very different outcome this year as a result of the pandemic. There's a lot of concerns, obviously, about addressing COVID readiness um, for students coming up in the fall, addressing mental health issues, building out those programs, building out academic support, potentially building out capacity in things like our learning center and our other support programs. Um, and so those are all embedded in the conversation that I'm going to have. But um, the practice that has worked pretty well, given the way that the high school program um, gets set, which is that around this time every year, we begin the process of building out, looking at student needs, building out our various class offerings, get the class offerings, and then driven based on student need, we build the schedule. Um, what we've done over the last years, and that's represented in the table and the memo that I sent you, um, is tried to work off essentially a multiplier, which keeps our staffing consistent at, at the level we're at. Now, I'm just gonna say this right now, um, if we have additional funds to provide additional social workers or additional teachers to support um, the concerns that we do have going forward, we will 100% take them. Um, what we are talking about here is how we work with sort of the flat um, funding that's based on enrollment growth. So this year we had expected growth of anywhere from 40 to 105 students. Um, and as a result of the pandemic and likely the, the construction project, we actually were flat. We went down by just a handful, like four or five um, students, depending on which day you look. Um, based on our estimates right now, we're estimating 36 students next year, which would be part of the anticipated increase and not recouping many of the students that went elsewhere. If that's not the case, we're gonna obviously be looking for reserve positions. So in addition to this, I would just make a recommendation in planning the schedule that the superintendent this year have a large portion of reserve positions because the enrollment impacts at the different levels are gonna be very hard to predict. So again, with the 36 students anticipated um, in order to keep enrollment levels high and staff, I'm, I'm sorry, staffing levels where they are, staff the classes that we would need to staff for those additional students, and then proportionally staff the uh, support services we would need for those additional students, we would be looking at 2.45 FTE. And the way we um, anticipate um, distributing those right now would be that um, two of those um, FTE would go towards classroom teachers, staffing um, core classes, and also at this point, we really are desperate for staffing additional um, electives, as you can see right now, and students who'd like to get a fourth class, but where there's not enough room for that. And we've also been going through this uh, five-year process of building inclusion model around co-teaching. At this point, we have co-teaching in every single uh, core department area except for the world languages um, and in almost all of the um, required classes. In order for those co-taught classes to be truly inclusion, you really want to keep the number of students in IEPs um, under 30%. And so we anticipate needing a couple more sections of co-teaching in order to be able to have the full distribution of students. Um, and then an ask that is uh, new this year, driven by student need, not by the increase in, increase in enrollment, is the speech and language pathologist um, assistant. Um, and I know that Ms. Elmer will be talking about that more when she speaks about the budget from the special education perspective. But simple, simply put, um, the speech and language pathologist assistant is supervised by our current speech and language teacher and allows us to serve a wider range of students with the increasing need for that level. So that's a relatively simple ask, and it's outlined in terms of the general expectations that lead to that based on the model we have at the school. Um, but in addition, next year, we will be finishing, very exciting, phase one. So the building that's currently going up in the front, uh, the steel is going up, um, will be done in January of 2022, if all things go according to plan. That will create some staffing needs, as well as some other costs. So right now, going into the fall, the coordination of the process of moving half the school halfway through the year, coordinating the construction project, and then during phase two, coordinating classes that will now be wrapping around the um, construction project, which will be happening where the theater is, we really anticipate that the administration, particularly the assistant principal, is going to need a half-time secretary to support the um, logistics around that and scheduling. In addition, built into the building, there's two entrances. So in the, the design of the building, there's a main entrance on the field side and a main entrance on the uh, Mass Ave side. In January, the main entrance on the Mass Ave side will be open. Right now we have a temporary main entrance on the other side. 
those are intended to be staffed by an attendance and reception person. Um, and that person will start halfway through the year. So that's half an FTE. And that is carried over to the next year when it'll have to be a full-time position. In addition, as we are wrapping around the building, right now we have a mile and a half of hallways. We will have even more during the construction project. And in order to be able to supervise that sprawling building and particularly the links, we're looking again, needing a half-time paraprofessional building sub. So those combined into a 1.0 paraprofessional position. It's actually two positions hired halfway through the year, which is why in order to make them full-time the following year, you'll need to add an additional position. So that's 1.5 positions for the building project. And then skipping down pretty quickly through the memo, um, the one additional cost, which is worth noting related to the building project, is when we return in the fall, um, a number of staff who were moved across the building in order to get into the spaces um, that were appropriate for their classes, the in-school um, programming that we have right now, are going to need to move back or into other spaces. There will be some shifting around then. And then in January, uh, almost 80% of the building will be either moving classrooms within the existing buildings or shifting into the new building. And by contract, those staff get a per diem for the move. So we're anticipating roughly $40,000 in staff per diem, essentially a day's pay for everybody, uh, for every teacher in the school. Um, and then I also just want to remind folks as we're planning going into the next year, that in the process of preparing for the pandemic and for um, the remote instruction in particular, um, we, the high school and through across the district handed out a large number of Chromebooks. Um, we've also broken up our, our um, computer labs in order to get teachers monitors um, and distributed materials around. So those are gonna have to be recouped and refurbished. We expect some breakage and loss. And so planning for the, that digital technology is gonna be extremely important. So that is a very truncated version of the budget for this year. And I thank you for, you for your attention. Thank you. Questions or comments? Never heard me speak that shortly. You're all stunned. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. No, 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 we're not stumped. Um, I, first, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Changer his thoughts on maintaining the four by four schedule next year. So um, there's a number of things that we have done this year, which are good practices that are successful in other areas. Um, and based on learning and experience this year, some people were asking the question, the four by four schedule, heterogeneous grouping, and, um, and some of the structures we've had around advisory. I would guess I would say that is a conversation for later in the year for January and February. Um, I know that there's a lot of support for that in the English department, and there's a lot of support for that in special education. Um, I also know that there have been concerns around that for math and world language and performing arts. So it is a conversation we will have, um, but it's not a conversation I'm prepared to have. I can only handle so many um, balls in the air at the same time. I only I ask that for budgetary purposes. Yeah. So for budgetary purposes, I don't think that it will really, it, it does make some effects in the way we shuffle, but it doesn't affect staffing levels the way we are right now. There is one advantage to the four by four if you build it out, mm -hmm. which does allow students to accelerate. And there are students right now who are experiencing that and looking to take more classes. Um, that would, would, if we could, it would be nice to be able to staff that in order to give students more opportunities. Yeah, that, that in, impacts the kinds of teachers you need to have within, within the uh, scheduled day as well. So, uh, you know, I, I'm looking at that in terms of what, what's going to happen with the schedule. Now, you also mentioned the stipends and the move. Is that something coming out of our operating budget, the high school's operating budget? Is this a line item? Where, where, where do I find that money in the budget process? Dr. Brody and Michael Mason, would you like to respond to that? Kathy, you want me to respond to that? Um, yeah, so this is something that um, we're, not, uh, we're not entirely sure, uh, but we believe that this will probably work with the town to come out of uh, a capital related uh, request. Uh, this since it's tied to the project, um, but I can't speak with certainty yet. I'm not sure if Kathy wants to add to that. 
Um, we don't know the, the answer to that yet. That, that's fine for now, but obviously we're going to need to know the answer to that uh, as we're looking to build a, a more solid budget for next year. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Thanks. So uh, again, just repeating the comment, uh, I mean, you mentioned that you're looking sort of at the, the flat budget, but it I would put together a recovery budget and things that you think you need for next year to recover from this year to go along with your, your additional requests. So just to be clear, as I was trying to say at the beginning, um, the fact that I'm not asking for additional funds in order to do the recovery programming, right, doesn't mean that we're not already planning around recovery programming. Um, so the issue for us becomes, I mean, I, I try very hard to be within the reality of the money that is available. There's not infinite funds available. And so, um, I mean, I can tell you right now where we would put additional funds if we had them, right? We would put them towards social work, we would put them towards learning center, we'd put them towards uh, building out our harbor program, building out the workplace, um, building out the learning center, and potentially towards, and towards summer school and, um, and potentially night school if that becomes an issue later on. Um, we work within the funds that we have and the staffing that we have to build those things. And, you know, that is where we've built over time those programs out of existing funds and levels. So, right. But, but, but for next year, we have the opportunity to ask for additional funds specifically for recovery purposes. So we should, we should make a request. We may not get it, but, but we should make a request. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, I, did, I just I, I had a general comment to make after all three presentations. So thanks to all three principals for their presentations tonight. And that is that <clears throat> I'm not sure sitting here in December, we can know and understand everything we're going to need in September of 2021. And so I, I do think, and I, I'm sure the budget subcommittee is already thinking about this, Dr. Bodhi and Mr. Mason are already thinking about this, but <clears throat> we do, we should have a reserve fund of some amount in the budget to accommodate um, mm -hmm. items and ex expenditures of personnel and resources that we're, we, we're going to figure out we need uh, over the course of the summer. Um, we're not gonna have it all. I don't think we're gonna have the whole budget. And we're gonna have to present a budget at the town meeting. I understand that's our duty and responsibility and we'll do that. But within that budget, there needs to be some unanswered, some, some money for unanswered questions because we're not gonna have a final idea of what the school year is gonna look like, I, I'm, I think until sometime in the summer. There's a lot of, a lot we have to do to, to get ready. And um, so that's my only point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bodhi. Um, I, I totally agree with the comments been made about reserve positions and uh, because what's going to be involved with recovery, we don't entirely know yet. Uh, and so we've always, in many recent years, had some built-in reserve positions. Uh, we're going to ask for an increase in those numbers this year for exactly the reason you mentioned, that we're not going to know really until after the budget is approved uh, what our needs could be uh, this summer. Dr. Al Snappy. Thank you. Um, I just want to echo what Mr. Cardin said, that the more specific you can be about needs and recovery, uh, the more help we can be to you, because this year, the dance between the town and schools in terms of how much money we get is going to be squishy because it, it's not following normal. I mean, there is a normal formula, but there's going to be other negotiations going on. And so if we have specifics that, and this actually goes for all principals, um, if we have specifics, it's easier for us to advocate strongly. And uh, so, you know, help us help you. Thank you. And, and I'm gonna have to be driving soon, so I'll listen in, but I won't be able to talk or anything. All right, anybody else for Dr. Jenger? Great. Okay. 
Um, thank you, um, Madame Pierre Maxwell and Mr. Meringer and Dr. Jenger for doing yours. Um, I hope that um, I hope. I know Dr. Jangir later on the schedule. I hope um, Mr. Meringer and Madame Pierre Maxwell, you can stay uh, to listen to uh, Ms. Fernandez do the AEA budget priorities, and then we'll do questions for her, and then that will wrap up our um, budget process for this evening. So, Ms. Fernandez, go ahead. Thank you um, all for the opportunity to share with you this evening the AEA's budget priorities for the secondary level this year has been very difficult in many ways, but one of the best things to come from it is that in terms of teaching staff, we are finally close to appropriately staffed. By hiring additional teachers, particularly in special education, our class sizes and caseloads have been brought down to a level that's much more manageable. We want to advocate um, for retaining the extra positions that were added this year, such as the learning communities at the Gibbs and at Audison, and particularly the special education additions in grades six through eight. Uh, one area that still needs additional staffing is counseling. The pandemic has increased the need for social emotional outreach and mental health counseling, and our counselors are stretched very thin as it is. Um, additional counselors and social workers for students who are not on IEPs would enable them to more quickly respond to student needs and allow time in their schedules for teaching coping skills preventatively before the problems arise. Um, our special educators have been working above and beyond this year with increased required documentation and increased communication with families, learning to support students in a new way. Um, and of course, at the high school being the only teachers in the building each day with students. Um, teachers in our special education programs in particular are responsible for providing services, teaching classes and managing a caseload. But some of them also do the extra work of running their programs. Um, which would include scheduling students and scheduling their BSPs and handling the overall communication about the programs. So we are requesting um, a stipend for these program leader positions to reflect that extra work. Um, in addition, we strongly believe the school committee needs to plan for salary increases for all educators. We have been working overtime this past year without additional compensation. The shift to remote and hybrid teaching has meant a complete redesign of curriculum from pre-K to 12 with almost no time in which to do that work. Um, there's also an increase in communication with students and families who are working remotely, which has taken additional hours every day. Many of our staff are putting their lives on the line each day to come into buildings during a time of unprecedented community spread of a deadly disease. But beyond the pandemic, Arlington continues to lose highly qualified staff to neighboring districts that offer higher salaries. We don't want to be the training ground for great teachers in other districts. And that means offering a competitive compensation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fernandez. Um, questions? OK, great. Um, so thank you to everybody who presented tonight. Um, thank you to the um, to the AEA and uh, your team and to Madame Pierre Maxwell and Mr. Maringer and Dr. Jenger. Um, we, uh, we appreciate uh, this part of the process. This is my favorite part of the process. Um, so I'm glad that we were able to do this um, this evening. So, um, and for the public, the, the documents um, are all in Novus uh, that list out um, that list out the requests. Uh, great. So the next item on the agenda is the Arlington High School hybrid options discussion. Um, Dr. Bodie, are you going to start or do you want Dr. Jenger to start? I think it would be appropriate for Dr. Jenger to start. Thank you. All right. Dr. Jenger, go ahead. That's why no one heard my question because I'm muted. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen now if that's all right. Um, does everyone see, now see Arlington High School semester two proposal? Yes, thanks. Okay, so um, I'm gonna present all 105 slides that are showed here. I'm kidding, I'm not going to do that. Um, but there's been a lot of conversation around um, sort of showing work and having detail. Um, and so I wanted to pull as much as 
possible of the information and work that's been done on this together in one place so that folks could go through this in some detail. Um, I've made, I believe, four presentations to the school committee um, about this topic, um, more slideshows. Um, there have been surveys and videos sent out to the community. I've had two focus groups with parents, um, the listening session that we had recently with the community, uh, two focus groups with students, two focus, uh, a team of staff working with me on this. So there's been a lot of um, effort to try to make this. And one of the things I realized in being a principal, and I've been a principal now for a long time, is there come times um, when you have to, these decisions you have to make where no matter what decision you make, there are people angry at you on both sides. Um, and what really we, I, and the, the school committee are called upon to do is to listen to both sides with an open mind, to look at the information that we have, and then to make the best decision we can. And to understand that most likely um, we, will, we will continue to have some strong voices on both sides of the issue that aren't happy with where we are. And that's not what we like to do. Most of the time um, in my department heads and my team with my staff and conversations, we really work to have conversations that are by consensus. But in this kind of an environment, it's not always possible because people have individual needs and individual concerns that aren't served. And so I understand that and I'm listening and have heard um, what folks have been talking about. Um, so in this presentation, I feel like we've had a lot of conversations and a lot of depth and I'm gonna just talk a little now, um, but people want things that are simple to understand because these schedules are very complicated. It's hard to visualize, it's hard to walk yourself through it. It's hard to understand all of the trade-offs that you would go into there. Um, there have been conversations about, can I know exactly what would happen? but it misunderstands the way a high school schedule was built, which is it depends on who chooses what we go through. And if um, you know this many students choose BC calculus, we run a section. If they don't, we don't. In this case, if we were dividing the school into two or three piles to create a hybrid model, it would depend on where those students made selections and what we were able to staff, whether we would be able to offer sections, for example, of that at all. So what I can tell you is that classes that span across, that are standalones would be affected, classes that are um, spread across grades would be affected, but I can't tell you exactly which ones we would choose um, to consolidate or cut or shift. And then depending on what programming we had and what staffing we had available, whether we could run tinier sections of some of those things. So going quickly at the 30,000 um, foot level. So what I wanna do quickly, I just reviewed the process. I want to very quickly review the survey results. I want to make a proposal because I believe that we are at that place. And then I'd like to clarify um, what I'd like to do for um, planning steps. So I'm going to, oops, what just happened? That wasn't supposed to happen. All right. Wow, my computer's doing weird things. I apologize. All right, so we talked about these focus goals and the question was across all of them to look at each of these different models in order to try to focus on what approach is going to serve best these different key goals that we have and how to prioritize those goals in the different models. We had a good response rate. We had 414 students, 757 parents, 88 teachers. That's a fairly large proportion of each of those populations. And in the end, so I used to do survey research, and I'm not saying that this is brilliant, and maybe my research approach um, led to a survey like this that is complicated to read, but was meant to help me to understand and to get a clear view of not just the, the sort of high level, what do people want, but to really dig down under it. And in the end, when one does a survey like this, sometimes you don't get a clear answer. But in this case, I think we did. And the clear answer is this, first, um, if you look at the levels of satisfaction, about 80% of folks on this satisfaction, students and families, three and above on a Likert scale are saying that they're relatively satisfied with the current model. And almost all staff are saying they're relatively satisfied with the current model. Why is it different? Because they have different priorities as you'll see down, as you saw when we talked about that below. But in both cases, those are extremely high levels of satisfaction. In terms of academic progress, our students and our families were reporting 
the, the levels of academic work um, and challenge were about right for most, a little high and a little low, students feeling a little high, parents feeling a little low, but on generally on target. And staff, quite remarkably, given the situation, were reporting in 83% of the cases that students were at or above standard. Now remember, this isn't a case when we keep talking about how students are falling behind academically. I met today with principals from the Middlesex League and they were talking about failure rates that were double their normal rate. Um, and so we're looking at students making adequate academic progress in spite of the challenges. You heard from teachers talking about that today. I think you've seen letters from teachers. There have been comments throughout. That's being done. Um, on the shoulders of teachers who are working tirelessly long hours, much beyond you know, a 40 or a 50 hour week in order to change the way they teach, to follow up with students, that's why the attendance is strong, um, to grade and get feedback quickly, to modify things. And that's a huge burden and one that is not entirely sustainable. We've been doing this now for eight months, reinventing ourselves every few months. Um, and doing it under conditions of extreme uncertainty and anxiety and stress for ourselves. So the most recent um, analysis we did was the quarter grades, which just ended. Um, and I did not know, right? We worry every year, every fall, we get together on our student study team and are concerned with all the students that are failing. And then every year we look back and say, but is it more or less than in the past? And when we ran the quarter grade comparison this year, compared to last year, um, we were quite happily surprised to find that D's and F's are consistent with past proportions. So the numbers are smaller, remember, because we're offering fewer classes. So what we're looking at is the proportion of grades. Um, and one of the things we saw, and the teachers have been talking about this, is that we actually have a higher level of A's. Um, and the question then would be, is that grade inflation? Well, the conversation has been teachers going to the department heads and saying, I'm sorry, but the kids are doing really good work. We're giving them some better grades. Um, and so that's really pretty, again, remarkable um, given the current situation. That's just a pretty picture of the same information. And at the same time, we're seeing continuing levels of attendance, but we know, and this is really super important, there are students who are really struggling. We have ongoing concern about student social interaction and isolation and worry. We have ongoing concern for students who need more in-person academics. Um, we are not seeing an increase in M's, although we're calculating it differently because the quarters versus the semester versus, um, but it, it appears that the number of students who are medically excused from the work um, is not above what it has been in the past at this time. Um, but we are worried about it. And we're worried that over time, right, the, the fatigue continues to, to mount. And so it is something that we're really concerned about. But at this point, what we are seeing is a high level of success and a relatively high level of satisfaction with the current model. So then we look at the model comparisons. And I'm gonna be very quick. You were offered essentially four models um, and the three different models were meant to test not just individual, you can do it this way, but they had features that allowed us to see whether or not people wanted particular things. So the four cohort model got you in without having to change the schedule, without having to have a remote active uh, academy, got you into class on a regular basis, but it had the trade-off of four cohorts because that's what our building demands. The departmental shift kept our current model, but created more structure so that students would come in once or twice a week in order to be able to have that social interaction. And then the grade shift to cohort model um, was a way of solving this question of, can we do a two cohort model? But the only way to do that is to divide the school in half and to have a remote academy. If one did a simple AB cohort, there'd still be a division of the school in some way, and there would also be the need for the remote academy. So there is a loss of, of, of opportunity. We can't say exactly what it would be, but we know that classes that are standalones, classes that have um, combinations of 10th, 11th, 9th, 12th graders in them would be split in half. And then depending on where students fell, we would either offer one or the other or neither or have to staff them differently. That we'd have to simplify electives. We'd have to um, reduce offerings, particularly in things like Mandarin, um, Italian, um, 
Mandarin, Italian, and um, Latin because there's only a small number of courses in each of those levels in those. So those are the things that would be affected. And what did we see? We saw that the priorities were different. Teachers prioritized safety, COVID readiness, mental health, equity, and academics as the sort of fourth and fifth that tended to be tied. Um, and families and students both prioritized safety, academics, mental health, and then social interaction and COVID readiness were in their fourth and fifth category. The question was asking people, what were they most concerned with? And so what we see then is that although these things are levels of concern for a large proportion of the population, their levels of concern um, were first safety and then academics fell before mental health for this families and students. It doesn't again mean that for those students struggling with mental health concerns, that it is not a five for them, that it's not right at the top of their priorities. And that's something we need to differentiate for. So I'm not gonna talk very quickly about those, but so that led us down to the comparison. Based on those priorities, which model did students, families, and staff feel best served those priority areas? And that's where the survey was shockingly clear. In every single category but one, students, families, and staff agree that the departmental shift best serves those priority areas. So to keep on moving around looking for a better option when it is clear that that departmental shift, it's not that they're saying, well, I like mental, I think mental health is important and this one's better for mental health, but academics is less and therefore maybe there's a trade-off that's close. It, it's really not close at all. It's the only place where the departmental shift doesn't come in first is in students' perception of safety where it's roughly tied with the four cohort model. And the grade shift to cohort model, which gives you an example of how much appetite people have, I mean, that's a one-to-one -one trade off every other week. And when you get a sense of how much appetite people have for changing course require, uh, options and having and lost losing instructional time in order to get in, that's the least popular model. And the one that most of the community feels least well serves mental health and even social interaction. Um, and so it seems pretty clear to me that that's the direction we wanna go. Now, the next question people said, many people said was, well, why not just keep the current model? And when you look at the survey, I'm only doing the chart version, this is the pretty picture version, but the simple summary is actually in each category, people slightly preferred the current model over the departmental shift. And the reason for that, if you look very quickly through each of these, is the, is the, the plus in fewer, act, fewer meetings. A and not to dispense with the survey there when, when it serves, suits us, but that issue, one being safe versus another being safe, I think goes to the planning that we have to do now. So my proposal, my recommendation, is that we assume a departmental shift. And the reason why I would say a departmental shift and not the current model is because the main difference between the two is that the reverse field trips were intermittent, they were difficult to plan, um, and they were um, not necessarily very effective. And with the time we have and the experience we have, we can schedule those in a rotation. I've already started meeting with departments in anticipation of this to see what they would want to do, to think about you know, where would the band meet? Where would the chorus meet? When would they schedule to be able to do that? How would they transition? Um, what would that look like for the drama class? How would you do that? That's the last people I met with. Um, and so my recommendation is that we do adopt the departmental shift. We keep the current semesterized model. Um, if you look at the little blue links, if anybody's going through that, that's where you can find the videos of me explaining each of these models in more detail. Um, and so I'm gonna go through that. This is what we've already talked about, the departmental shift with a rotation. As I was explaining before, the difference in a shift and a field trip is that we planned for two field trips and we, hope, we pushed on teachers to make them happen under the departmental shift, given that there's a 17 week term that we probably don't want one the first and last week of the term, that we're gonna lose some time for AP exams, MCAS, 
and other things, we imagine doing a rotation that would mean that each class would meet four to eight times um, and that we would have department by department conversations about how those were structured. Um, we have the eight large spaces, we have our other large spaces, and we propose to build out the larger lab spaces so that different programs can use them effectively. Um, we know that in terms of COVID readiness, and this I think addresses the safety concern that many of the groups had, that we're not gonna hold in-person instruction if there's reasonable concern about in-school transmission. And that we absolutely believe that we can set up facilities where staff can control their, their interaction with kids and where social distancing can be reasonable and ventilation can be substantial. Um, under this, any student can choose remote. So if there are folks who are particularly concerned about coming in, they don't have to choose to come in for the shifts. So what would I see as the planning timeline and some of the issues? So I'm hoping very much that you make a decision tonight. Um, I had actually hoped that we would make a decision a few weeks ago, but when we discussed when was the last point at which the decision could happen, this was the date that we were targeting. Um, why is that? Because the end of the semester is not far away. We have a week and a half before Christmas, um, and then we will come back for about three to four weeks, and then it will be the next semester. If we need to hire staff, which we like, we will want to do for programming, potentially for support programming for students that we talk about later um, to fill the various slots, we need to start hiring that staff now. It takes two to four weeks to do so. It takes two to four weeks to plan programs and other supplemental things that we are working on. Um, it will take us two to four weeks to finish ordering and building out sound systems and other sorts of things. So we really want to deal with that. Um, we believe it's going to be necessary, given the feedback we've gotten, to do some follow-up work at the actual schedule and to refine the number and sequence of shifts. I'd like to have, um, we have heard a lot of feedback with concerns about the Wednesday schedule. And I actually believe that using the Wednesday time, we can address some of the issues about transmission transition that I think school committee members heard from students yesterday and that other folks have expressed so that we could increase the transition time to make it easier for students to not get stranded at school before or after a shift. Um, we obviously have to address staffing needs, um, some of those being issues around accommodations, because there are staff that are concerned. We need to work through what the staff concerns and issues are and potential hiring. And we would need to go through department by department, figuring out what those rotations are and figuring out what kinds of facilities issues we need. My plan would be that by January 4th or very soon thereafter, uh, department rotation with more detail about how it's gonna work and when it's gonna work would be shared with staff and then shortly after with the community. So a community a kid could look at their schedule and figure out what the schedule was gonna look like and when they're gonna come in. Um, and begin to work through planning for that. Um, at that point, we're going to want students and parents to know enough to be able to affirmatively opt in or opt out of the shifts, which will affect our planning. Um, and then February 8th, semester two would begin. And when we return from break, we would expect the shifts would begin. Um, so that is my hope. Um, some purchases that we imagine um, we've uh, priced out sound systems for the large spaces with um, headsets for staff so that they don't have to touch anything and they can be heard easily when students are spread out um, at, at about $20,000 for the spaces we have. We're looking at projection and, and screens for those spaces um, up to about $5,000. I don't have a price on the um, electric heat lights and the links, which would give us an additional outdoor space. Um, particularly for chorus, but also for other programs. We've already begun to purchase pads and muffles and things that allow um, the band to have more practice space. The labs um, for science, um, and that's actually science, family and consumer science arts. We would need monitors so that you could watch from one to the other in plexiglass. We're estimating about 8,000 for the four labs um, total. Um, we would need to plan a bus. Uh, for our students coming in from Boston. The plan would be to actually specifically look at those student schedules, see how it's affected by the rotation, because right now um, that bus is relatively full, I believe on Mondays and Tuesdays, but less so on Thursdays and Fridays. So as much as we could shift 
the classes that those students are taking to have their shifts on Thursdays and Fridays. We hopefully could um, could consolidate on the buses, but there probably would be some additional transportation. We're already at the point now where a number of students are coming in from Boston just to use the building and access services. Um, and so we're, we're, we're at the point where we're just about needing another bus anyway. Then there's the issue of tutoring and targeted support, um, building programming, um, both building out some of the in-school programs right now that we really wanna promote to students who are beginning to struggle, as well as this possibility of creating um, a, a small focused hybrid academy. So uh, an academy for students who are really struggling that would focus on core requirements most likely in the morning, we believe that would take two FTE to support. Um, and not entirely related to this, but something which is just on our radar right now is this AP and MCAS preview and review, which we've started to plan out. So to have students begin right now for their spring classes in preview for their, their APs, getting ramped up because the time is short. Um, and for students who finish their APs right now, and MCAS courses to be doing review as they go to the MCAS and the um, AP. Um, so some additional planning that's not so much the timeline about this, but is an important thing that we are doing right now and will continue to do um, to develop academic interventions, credit recovery, in-person options for um, struggling students. And I just want to review quickly because I was Reviewing those with Dr. Bodhi, a memo went out recently to the parents about this. It's gone out a few times, but I'm not sure the word is getting out and I'm not sure the school committee is understood. Right now we have the learning center. It is open and available in school. We offer that to students who are, have, need a supervised space with a tutor. So um, they can come into school and work four days a week as long as there's space available with the um, staff tutors there available. That's something that was in place before, but now it's in place for in-person. A lot of the students are getting tutoring support um, remotely from those teachers, but there's a very small number. So there's still capacity there in the learning center. And that is something we could potentially build out. The Harbor program, which su supports students with social emotional challenges, again, a general education program for students with chronic and complex mental and medical health issues, um, that staff and students are able to come into that program four days a week if they need support in staying engaged with classes. And there are actually three paraprofessionals who um, do case management and support those students in staying engaged in classes. And they work with our general education social workers. That is a program which I wouldn't mind adding staffing to next year in anticipation and which we may build out again if we reach capacity going into the spring. The workplace is a program that we have that's been remarkably effective. Those students um, have been coming in every day and those are students often who don't come in. Um, and that's a student that's available for students who kind of need wraparound services, um, usually social work and uh, more um, self-contained programming. Um, that's supported by two staff. That's our oldest alternative program. And again, that program still has capacity as two people want to apply. Our special education programs have um, teachers and liaisons have reached out to every single special education student and offered them to be able to come into the building in person. Um, the numbers of students coming in still remains relatively small and most come in for only part of the day. They come in for the class, academic support and if they have any special education class and then many of them, if, if they can transition home again. And then the last thing which I've mentioned a couple of times, which once we've sort of worked on this, looking at the failures um, one of the things we will start to do right away is to do a needs assessment around what kind of interest, what, you know, what kind of interest is there in a small focused hybrid academy. And we, you know, because you can only staff, you know, one ninth grade English, one ninth grade math, it would be ninth grade English. It wouldn't be um, a, a range of different options and electives. Um, but we have some models in mind about how that could work. And based on sort of some iterative conversations with the targeted population, we would float out a plan for that. Um, so mental health interventions, we've talked before about the COVID screening, that's going forward. Um, we have interface available. I know uh, Ms. Morgan talked before about the challenges of folks finding special education, uh, finding support services for mental health. Um, and AYCC I know has been stepping up and, and offering services. And then the interface program is something 
which gives us extra capacity for referral. So if folks are having trouble finding resources for their children, please reach out to our counselors and social workers because they will help you to, um, to connect. And, um, and if they're not able to, and that's not working, let me know so that we can escalate that because that is obviously something that Ms. Bird, our social emotional uh, learning director is really working on making sure that students have access. And then a big thing that everyone's worried about, and I know we're worried about, and I would like to start working on it as soon as possible. There are people already working on um, senior events, uh, school-wide events, volunteer support, um, and the student council um, activities for social interaction. Uh, I already talked about remote requests. I know we've already talked about model summaries, so I am done. Thank you. Questions? Um, so Dr. Janger, can you stop sharing your screen just so that I can see where we're at? It's, there's, um, perfect, thank you so much. We can go back to the slides um, as, as needed. So um, Mr. Hainer, so should we do, um, should we do, let's do questions and comments. And then I know um, there are, um, there were a few motions that came through Karen. Um, so we can, we can work on, on looking at those, but let's do questions. Um, if we've, you know, questions on Dr. Janger's presentation, um, Ms. Exton, or comments, obviously. Um, sorry, I have a lot of thoughts here that I'm trying to, <laughs> um, I mean, I feel like Dr. Janger brought, um, sort of addressed some of the things that I was thinking about in terms of, um, you know, facilitating or supporting students' transportation um, into school. That was a big concern um, at the meeting with the students yesterday. Um, sort of ways to address students staying, um, if they're staying for a, a remote class after an in-person class and how to make that um, just more, um, more conducive to their learning. Um, and they shared some ideas and um, so I, so I guess, so that's just something I'm th thinking about, but I feel like um, you talked about that too, Dr. Jenger. And then, um, you know, the use of, of Wednesdays, you had said something about, um, would you switch classes? Can you say a little more about the Wednesdays? I guess that's, I didn't fully understand what yeah. your thoughts are. I, this is one of these things that has been discussed with some groups of teachers, um, but not many groups of teachers. And uh, it's a conversation I'd like to sort of work through, but I suffice it to say that around uh, right now, on purpose, we consolidated a lot of our, uh, you know, one, we put a lot of activities that are not visible, right? Student support, um, meetings, class prep, all those sorts of things um, onto Wednesday and use that as a place to put um, the PE classes in the advisory. Um, so that was sort of an independent day. It means that students feel largely unsupervised during that day. And so that's something that's not um, super popular there. Um, so anyway, the idea is that there is some flexibility in moving around those times. And we believe that moving around those times, we can create some longer transition times um, as well as more support on Wednesdays. But we really wanna make sure that that's a conversation we have with teachers and with the union, because that's, I, 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 I cannot emphasize enough that part of the reason teachers have been able to be successful in making this turn to effectively engage students, to follow up with students, to keep those failure rates where they are and to make academic progress is because they've had time to reach those students, to do the prep and to talk to their colleagues. So I wanna have a conversation with them, but I just suffice it to say, we believe we can shift around time to create bigger transition time. So the number of students um, and the length of time a student might not be able to transition would be shorter. The transition times would be longer. There would be more support on Wednesdays. Um, and for the issue of study halls, we do currently have students, sizable numbers of students who are working in the building in study halls. And we, we know the setting that is necessary for them to be able to participate in a remote class. 
um, effectively. And, and kids are coming in in order to, to participate in those. And so we spread them out and we problem solve around that. We've purchased um, headsets that we've issued to students who are coming in regularly. We have about 80 right now left. We would probably need a lot more, but that's budgeted for. Um, and, but I also, given the way we think the planning would work and given sort of the percentages, I think the number of students who would be sort of stuck for a study hall period would be in the five to 10 range. And it would be, you know, once every three weeks, it wouldn't be in the 50 to 100 range. And so we have plenty of room to spread those students out. Um, but until I finalize the schedule, I promise you, I will give you a matrix of why it works that way. Um, but I don't really want to share it in detail right now because we haven't gone through that with folks. Unless Julie begs me to, and then I will. <laughs> I th so I think right now, those are my, those were my sort of questions and comments. I, so thanks, Ms. Morgan. Mr. Curtin. Uh, thanks. So two hopefully quick questions. So the, the four to eight times that there would be a shift out of, that's out of 17 weeks. So out of 17 weeks, there might be a, a student that only has in person four times. No, that's per class. Right, but four times for like, let's say I have an English class, it might only be four times over the, the 17 weeks. So if you came in every other week in 17 weeks and you didn't come in the first and last week, that would be 15 weeks, you'd come in seven times, right? And um, so then the question is, and I think we asked the students yesterday, and this is a question I think to have in terms of how much the students value the in-person versus how much they don't want to have to do the transition. I think we want to make it so that students on average are coming in at least once a week. We, in the accelerated model where it's every other week and the labs are rotating, students are coming in on the order of two times a week. Um, and so I think just right-sizing that again, based on some feedback from the community is going to be one of the conversations we need to have right away. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, so that, that's just helpful in understanding what we're approving is it's um, because of holidays and not doing the, the first week and the last week and taking weeks off for MCAS and other things, it may only be four times, five times, you know, for those classes that come every other week. For the lab classes, it would be double that most likely, right? For silver science, it would be, would be closer to the seven or eight. Yeah, I mean, again, I think we, one of the things that we can do is really sort of tailor it. I mean, so right now, family and consumer science, they're coming in every other week. I mean, half the class is coming in every other week. That's the way they're doing it right now. So a student comes in every other week, but somebody's coming in every other, every week. Um, some of them are actually doing it two days. And so the kids are coming in every week. So, you know, right now, performing arts, they're performing before and after school on a pretty regular basis. So some of those are gonna come in a lot more. The question then becomes kind of the minimum expectation. And I think, I mean, it, it doesn't sound like a lot, right? When you say, to, but that's the thing that you realize, it's only 17 weeks um, is the semester and 17 weeks goes by like that. Um, so if you came in every time, it would be 17 times, which doesn't sound like very much. If you come in every other time, it would be six to eight. But the goal would be to have kids coming in at least once a week um, so that there is that regular contact. Okay, um, and then do you have a sense of uh, the course load for teachers right now? Do do we is it like fifty percent are doing three classes and fifty percent are doing two classes and that'll flip, or is it did it somehow end up that like seventy percent are doing three classes this term, and so therefore next term it'll be seventy percent doing two classes? About two thirds right now are doing three classes, um, and but we've also held reserve positions and are looking to hire. Um, to be able to build out some of that. that and that, remember, we built the schedule for the whole year. So this, the periods are there. Um, there are, because of the shorthandedness in the spring, some large sections that we're trying to hire to cover um, additional sections of. Um, you know, there's a Spanish section that's 
there's, we need another some more Spanish, some more Mandarin. Um, but as but as far as sort of taking up some of the time on Wednesday, because two thirds of the staff will only be teaching two classes, that might be a little bit more palatable. Two thirds of the staff will have two empty periods every day. I see. Yeah, that make that makes sense. That could be okay. So just some some comments. Um, you know, I'm not sure that the departmental shift really addresses the need that that, that we're seeing. So 21% of the students and a higher percentage of the families are either not satisfied or just slightly satisfied with the way learning is currently structured. And you know, we've heard in listening sessions, you've all heard from you know quite a few families whose kids are struggling in the the current model. And, you know, I'm disappointed with some of the feedback we've received from the staff that even after sharing this, the survey results, there was really only one email that acknowledged this population. And I understand that staff, families, and others want to protect the model that's working for the majority of students, and we, we do need to do that. But I just don't think we have a real solution yet for, for those who, who this model isn't working. Um, so, I guess I'd still like to see, you know, uh, you mentioned a 50-50 hybrid for core classes, but I, I, I think, you know, I, I'd still like to see who would be interested in that 50-50 model. Um, is there enough to build uh, additional sections of classes that we could do? We, um, obviously we staffing we, would be an yeah. issue, but that would be something I'd be interested in seeing. And secondly, um, my other concern with this is, and some other um, my colleagues raised this last week, is if we do get a better situation in the spring with staff vaccinated and, you know, hopefully community spread coming down, it, it doesn't really seem like we can do much more in person with this model. I mean, I, I mentioned last week the possibility of flipping to a 50-50 model. But we really can't do that because we're, we're, we wouldn't be able to separate out the remote people at that point. So um, you mentioned maybe doing more frequent shifts, um, but that doesn't really add a lot. That's still people coming, kids coming into school for one period a day, maybe two times a week instead of one time a week. So I, I, I guess those are, those are the shortcomings I see with the model. I don't have solutions, but um, I'm open to hearing what my colleagues say. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey, we'll come back to you unless you hop on. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Um, so first, I just wanna ask some clarifying questions about the departmental shift. Um, and you, I know you said this, so in the 17 weeks of the semester, your anticipation is that students will get into school, um, how, many, how many hours do you think on average total? Well, if it's two, if it's one or two times a week, then it's going to be 15 to 30 hours. 15 to 30 hours. Okay. Um, and then there's the possibility of students remaining in the school for study halls if they sign up for it. Um, you had also talked about, could you also talk about the possibility of, of um, extracurricular activities such as athletics, clubs, uh, performing arts, meeting in the schools? in the second semester, do you envision that happening? They're already doing it. As clubs have met in the school, clubs are welcome to use those spaces, supervised and socially distanced. So performing um, arts, performing arts, like if there was a spring play, they would they would rehearse in the school? Um, so there are specific requirements for performing arts that actually have them 10 feet apart. Uh, singing is not allowed, period, unless it's outside right now. Um, we're looking at, there are guidelines around the instrumental music that actually allow instrumental music to perform inside now. Um, I'm not sure about performances, but to pre rehearse inside. And so we've been buying pads and you actually have muzzles for the, for the things so that your, your trumpet has a mask on it essentially. Um, and um, we're looking to, to allow um, obviously instrumental music to make use of the theater because that's one of our biggest spaces. For rehearsals um in terms of drama um you know i i hope springs eternal uh we, we 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 were all excited about i was excited about doing an outdoor performance of tommy um last spring when we didn't think that things were going to keep getting worse um and so you know i could imagine doing something on the field outside socially distanced um 
in fact, we talked about doing a, a, a live, not a live, a drive-in movie um, viewing of It's a Wonderful Life, but we don't have the rights. Um, so um, we're not allowed to, we're not allowed to make an assembly. You have to watch it on at home on individual screens. Um, so yeah, I think we'll figure out they're doing really creative things. They're running also performing arts this year is running more plays um, and than they have in the past. So they're running three shows right now are planned. Um, and uh, they're being actually directed by adults who are alums of the high school. Um, so they're coming back. I don't know if Jenna knew them. Did you know them, Jenna? Um, but uh, um, yeah, so that's also really exciting. So there's a lot of work being done. Okay, my uh, next question about the departmental shift. Um, <clears throat> it, if a if a family starts in the departmental shift, so first of all, it's I think it's correct to say that a student um, <clears throat> that if a family so chooses, they can keep their their student home on the hours on the fifteen to thirty hours when they'd be expected to be in school. Is that correct? Correct. And then there will be an attempt to either live stream the class, have have students call in, or get the work otherwise. Correct. Okay. So if a family decides, so the only way you can opt out of this model would be by simply keeping your, your student home on, on the day the students are supposed to be in school. You can't really, this is, I just want to make sure there's clarity for parents. I mean, so if, you, if you're in special education, you may choose to come in if you, um, yeah. you know, if, if, if we do this alternative focused hybrid program, that may be something, something yeah. we do. But if you're a general ed student who, you know, isn't looking like one of those targeted programs, then yes, your option would yeah. be to opt out of the shifts. Out of the shifts. Okay. I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, on the Wednesdays, are you envisioning, what are you envisioning? Are you envisioning instruction on those days possibly? Are you, I know this has to be discussed with teachers and I understand that, but what are you envisioning? Yes, I'm envisioning, You're envisioning instruction. Okay, I'm envisioning that we would shift to time in order to have more instruction on Wednesdays. One of the issues we ran into with the hybrid model in um, the elementary K through eight schools was that, or I mean, it was just it was yeah K through eight was a disproportionate number of students in the who had who had to come to school on Monday lost time. Uh, in school with in-person instruction, lost days. Are we, is this model going to contemplate a schedule that might have students normally coming in on a Monday and what the Monday holiday Monday holidays might have in terms of impact? So I have this fabulous spreadsheet that I use because we've had this five-day rotation, um, which meant that there were different drop classes. Yeah. And so our practice has been to actually do the schedule for the entire semester, which I, my plan is to do that in January. And you go through and you take all the drop classes out and you balance it. And I actually balance minutes um, and uh, keep tracking snow days um, in order to see if there needs to be any adjustment. Okay. One of um, one of the one of the things I'm concerned about is that we'll get to the end of the year and we'll still have uncertainty about next year. Um, and one thing that would give people assurances about what next year would look like is if we can find a way to get more students in the school this year. So my question is, would it be possible, to what extent can you pivot with the departmental shift to a model should things become better in the spring to allow more students and staff in the school, more hours? Is it, is, I know the 17 weeks in the semester goes by fast and all of a sudden you're in April and you might have good news and you might have everybody in the school, every teacher vaccinated. Is it possible to shift and at least get more students in the school somehow? I mean, I, I guess what I would say is I, I don't know about you, but I have not been able to predict the constraints that the scientists and the CDC. Tell. I know. I accept that. I accept. That. I, so the answer is yes, we can pivot. I think we're going to have a. I think there will be a reasonable conversation again about cost benefits of how much you're pivoting. The preference is that. Um, it seems like that were expressed early in the process in the focus groups and that seem to have been held consistent through the responses in the survey were to not do a really substantial shift, to not lose academic opportunities, um, to not require students to split off and therefore some haves and have nots. So those constraints 
um, you know, if and when, let's say the CDC comes out and says three feet now is like really fine and the union agrees and the Department of Education agrees um, and we say, okay, so now we're looking at these rooms. Now, all of a sudden my eight person rooms are 12 person rooms. If my eight person rooms are 12 person rooms, I can start looking at whether or not we wanna do an AB cohort. I will say that I believe Mr. Hainer asked yesterday the students um, the question of if you were offered an AB cohort or keeping what you have now, what would you pick? Forget safety. The students said departmental shift. Um, not all. I just want to qualify. The majority of those students in their answers use the word safety as an issue. Right. And they didn't oh, believe necessarily. They didn't hear it. They didn't hear it. Right. My, my qualifier. So, so I don't know. I think the question can be asked, but I think we'd have to ask the question again. And sure. I mean, I can, if, if it's three feet, then an AB cohort, I think would probably, I don't guarantee because I have to go measure it differently. But if it's two feet, if it's no feet, if there's no distancing, if masks and hygiene is sufficient, then clearly we could fit because we were going to fit in the building as it is. So when that changes, we'll remeasure, we'll do the new schedule and we'll see whether or not you can do that. And then I think you'll have to ask that question. Um, okay, uh, the, the uh, seniors, um, I know you're working on activities and I know senior activities normally take place later in the year, but this is an extraordinary year. How early can you actually have a senior activity next in, in 2021? Like, could you do something in January? Um, if you, <laughs> I believe so. I mean, I think most of those activities, right? They're not, it's funny when people said like, most of those activities are not run, you know, like graduation is run very much by us. Graduation costs about $20,000, yep. right? So if we wanted to do Friday senior movie nights, I mean, these things are gonna to start to happen. If you wanted to do Friday senior movie nights, you need 17 parents. We yep. need to clear it by the board of health um, and we need to get people projectors so they could do movie nights on the sides of their garages. Um, I think random acts of kindness, uh, walking challenges. I think those things are gonna start rolling out um, of the student council pretty quickly. So I'd expect, I want to start doing um, way more of that stuff coming in January. Um, and then the question of course is, you know, and I, I just have to say this because um, it hurts us sometimes, kids plan dances and nobody comes. You know, it's not cool. It's not what they wanna do. It's not what their friends do. So we will keep on moving to sort of trying new activities um, to try to keep more kids engaged. Um, and yeah, I think we'll just start doing things in January. Absolutely. Okay, I just, all right. I mean, uh, okay. So then I want to, you know, there were there were parents who who spoke at the meeting the other night. There were parents who spoke at the beginning of this meeting. All of us have received emails uh, from people asking us for data on the hybrid options that we that you listed in the in the report and there there were three you talked about the combined grade shift and two cohort model the limited hybrid academy and the second shift and in the report you talk about the fact that it it, it requires a substantial increase in staff um, and a substantial reduction in course offerings which i i i i I have no reason to doubt that's true, but people have asked for some of the data to support that. So is it possible well, to, to I think get that? I answered that earlier on in this presentation. So the grade shift two cohort model is one of the models that was offered, right? In the grade shift two cohort model, um, as I said, I don't know what classes would get offered to which groups or what classes would not be, but I can tell you that World languages would stretch across multiple grades. You're dividing all those classes in half this way. Um, and then you're having to pull out a remote academy. So 20 to 30% of your staff are now pulled out. And which classes we staff in the remote academy will depend on which kids chose the remote academy and which, um, which classes they are assigned to have selected. And you'll go through and the ones that will get cut will be your standalone classes, um, your, you know, your super Italian, Mandarin, 
um, Latin. Now we have teachers for that, but there's only one of those at every level. And you're not gonna have two sections of 10 because we don't have enough teachers. So one group or the other is gonna get them or you're gonna collapse them into four or fives. Um, the super classes, the um, many of those other classes, any standalone class, most of the art selectives, um, if they're gonna be divided this way and this way because you have to pull out the students and you have to pull out remote academy, they're gonna be grossly simplified. Um, so that's where you have the reductions in offerings. I can't tell you exactly what those would be. When we build the schedule, it takes us weeks to get everyone's collection information, then to look through how this, their requests go, then to look how they break, then to staff them up and do the puzzle. But I can tell you that that's where that would go. What I would say about the grade shift two cohort model is that I don't see a great appetite for that in the community as a whole, right? Given that trade-off, it's a two cohort model and understanding that there's going to be some loss in diversity of classes, it was the least popular model. So the next option is the two shift model. We could have a morning shift and an afternoon shift. That's what they do when they do construction projects and they tear down the building. Um, again, you're dividing the school in half and you're pulling out a remote academy. So you'd lose the same offerings in terms of diversity of offerings. And now you have to renegotiate that with the teachers union because that's not the schedule that they have. When we looked at any of these other models, remember twice as many staff, a substantial number of staff said they would ask for leaves of absence. So in addition to not being able to negotiate it, we're gonna lose staff. Um, and then the last, which was a targeted hybrid academy, I've already said, we're gonna try to do, um, right? Like I think that um, we've held back some FTE, we're gonna move around some FTE and I'm gonna beg Dr. Bodie and you um, for some additional FTE that with two FTE, that's 10 sections, we can schedule a math, English, science, social studies classes for core requirements um, that would allow students to come in and depending then on the number of students, you know, we would run that with 12 kids per section. Um, if it was 12 kids per section, we bring them in for four days. If it was 25 per section, we bring them in as an AB cohort. So I think we'll do some need, we need to define it so people know whether they're choosing it. We need to make sure we can staff it, which may be a challenge just to hire people. Right now we have a posted in, um, science position and we've had zero applications. Um, and, but we'll try. I mean, we'll do the needs assessment and we'll look to see whether we can get the staffing to do it. Um, and then just, I wanna point out, we do have programs right now that have capacity, the Learning Center, Harbor Shortstop, Workplace, and it's much easier for us to build out capacity in that kind of programming because we already have it if people are interested in those models. Okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I've asked all my questions, so I, I will come back to the discussion. The only thing I would say that echoes what um, Mr. Cardin said is that I, you know, one, I, I, I appreciate the hard work the teachers are doing. I, I do not deny that they're working very hard. Uh, two, I, I appreciate the great information. My reaction to that was, you know, uh, people often write their best prose when they're depressed. And so uh, I, I, I think that, um, you know, there's still a sizable chunk of the, the, the population of students. And I see this even among, among parents who tell me their kids are doing really well. I've even had parents who've actually said to me, my kid is doing really well, but she's not feeling that great about life right now. So I think it should be communicated to the teachers that yes, the kids might be doing well academically, but a lot of them are, are, are suffering and not doing well at home and not doing well in their lives. And I've heard this from countless parents and I didn't hear that in the remarks by teachers tonight. Can, can I respond to that? The teacher's first four priorities were safety, COVID readiness, mental health, and equity. Those were their first four priorities. And in every category, what they said was that the current model best served that. And I think that the assumption that in-person education, that, this, that, that the hybrid model is a panacea that is going to solve the problem of the pandemic. We are all stressed, we are all isolated, we are all frustrated and worried, every one of us. And people are working around the clock 
That is not because school is remote. And school right now is still a protective factor for those students. The fact that students are coming to school and succeeding in school is a protective factor for them. The idea, when you heard Mr. Martin talk earlier on, he was talking very much about engaging with his students and knowing who they were. And what he was saying was that he was not convinced, and he and I have argued about our levels of feelings about this, but he was not convinced that coming in in a very stressful environment of masks and whatever was necessarily better. Now, I know that other schools that are doing hybrid are experiencing levels of success there too, because the teachers have adapted and made it work. But I, I think that like the implication that people don't care or are not taking concern around students because they are finding that students are being successful and engaging and working with them and talking to them, um, you know, means that they don't care is really problematic because the teachers are, I can't express how hard they're working and how much they care and how much they think about their students all the time. I think that's my time. Um, Ms. Carmody and then Mr. Schickman. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to speak on this from more of a student perspective. Obviously, Mr. Thielman brought up concerns of students' mental health and then also concerns of if there's any options to have students go in more. But I think many students just want to go in at all. Right now we are having a thing or where we're going in once every few weeks with Dr. Janger's departmental switch. We'd be going in once every two weeks, maybe even like maybe even once every week, which I think many students would prefer that anyways, even if we are not going in like Every, like twice every week or something, I think many students would just like to go in and see people at all. And I think, although mental health is a huge concern with like online, obviously Dr. Yang said, it is just the stress of what's going on in the world right now that's like causing all of this. And it's not just the like being online. And I think that it could help to have students see each other because there are students right now that just haven't talked to like seen people in person for weeks on end. And it's obviously affecting them, but I just think that going in at all with just even if it is not a lot going in would be so helpful for many students. And I think we do need to adopt something that is hybrid just to help students and also just like to advance our learning because obviously learning online is very effective, but it's not the same as learning in person. If you're doing a science lab, you're not seeing this stuff in person. You're not seeing what they're like doing. like in real time you can't do it yourself at home and so i think it would just it would help a lot of students out to be able to be in person and see what is happening and learn in a new environment that's not just online thank you uh, mr schlickman thank you um so i, I just want to drill down on a few things because uh, one of the things that I've done in my career has been to schedule Lowell High School for a couple of years, which is a, a, scheduling any high school is a miserable job. So one of the premises of building a master schedule is that for every decision you make, everything you lock into on the foundation of your master schedule, you are limiting options for everything else you're building on top of the schedule. Uh, do you agree with that, Dr. Janger? All trade-offs, everything. Absolutely. Um, and the facility is, is, is the one uh, hard item that you can't work around. So that under normal times, the, the, the biggest limit on most school schedules is the size of the cafeteria. Um, We've gotten a lot of commentary as to, gee, you're doing an AB cohort on grades K through eight, but you can't do it nine through 12. The, as I'm looking at this, is that your average high school student has discrete schedules. So they're not traveling in groups throughout the day 
is in the middle school or staying with one teacher during the elementary, that each class is discrete with a different cohort of students in it. And that is what makes it difficult in just in theory to build a, uh, an AABB. Would you agree with that, Dr. Janger? Yes. Okay. Um, so essentially, if we were to try to do an AABB, we were taking one set of students, distributing them among three different schools with one faculty, so that the degrees of freedom within the arranging of students to classes makes it more difficult. Is that correct? That is correct. And that half of the freedom, degrees of freedom within your scheduling have already been eaten out because eaten up because you you've done four out of eight class periods scheduled for the year in the first semester, correct? Yes, that's true. So the fact that you've used classes and kids have gone to classes and teachers have taught classes is a limiting factor going forward into the second semester. I would, I would say yes. Okay. Um, so that if we were offering 10 sections, uh, how many sections of uh, English 10 do we offer? Um, I don't know, what is 20 into 350, about 17? Is that right, Mr. So, if we, so, so that if we're offering 17 sections of English 10, which is probably one of the most common classes in, in, in the school, we could easily divide those among two cohorts or three cohorts. Uh, again, remembering the fact that we've already division, divided the school in half so that if say we're uh, offering 17, we may have run eight of those sections already in the fall so that we're now only looking to do eight or nine in the spring. Correct. When it comes to doing, right? So when it comes to going forth and dealing not with the uh, split of nine English sections into three different cohorts, when we're looking for more, uh, for what are described as singletons, the courses that only have one section running during the school year, this is the real limiting factor, correct? Correct. So that if we were to go and change to a model that divides up the school, either the kids in a remote academy or in an AB cohort might be restricted so they couldn't get into that class, correct? All of them would be restricted. Yes, and that in theory, the, uh, if, one, if a student was looking for two difficult electives, one was offered in the AA cohort and one was offered in the BB, even though that they were both working within the, uh, the same, uh, mode of being on hybrid that one of those courses would have been precluded essentially yes okay so that essentially by going to some sort of a splitting the cohorts is the problem so that without going for the data this is sort of a logical stream if it's an if to then that if you uh, divide the groups and limit access to it in any individual course you will by, by virtue of the, uh, of the logic of setting up the schedule with every decision you're gonna restrict students. So while you may not be able to provide data that specifically says how many students would not be able to get into which particular courses, you're more or less mathematically and logically saying that this will happen to a certain extent. Correct. And that to come up with data as to which students are going to be shut out of courses that they are right now scheduled for in the spring, you wouldn't be able to do without extensive work in terms of trying to build a new master schedule for the spring semester. So it's, this is not sort of an easy thing to do. It's, it's, it's a long, long iterative process, uh, playing with power school and getting to the structure and loading it, correct? Correct. And it's also a, it's an ecological process, which is that as we make changes, people change people's schedules and it pushes itself into a, an outcome. 
Yeah, and so that if you're if you're going and building the schedule and you have a constraint that's in there, then the next step would be maybe to pull out that constraint and see what happens if that constraint is pulled out and you're putting a different one in instead, just to see if you can get a satisfaction rate that's higher for the students. Uh, so the satisfaction rate is the percentage of students who are getting all the courses that they want, correct? Right. So if we divert from something that is aligned with the fall builds, uh, which has students already scheduled for four periods in the spring, you're now going to be telling students uh, in a considerable number that they can't have something that they, they planned on having in the spring, correct? Correct. Okay. And so the departmental shift and the other shift are the only two scheduling options that aren't going to end up taking away classes from kids who have them already written into their schedule, correct? Essentially, yes. Okay. Um, I think we had this conversation in subcommittee in that the departmental shift in your opinion, and I think it's in my opinion too, is the model that allows you to do more to add in-person days or to pull out back and do fully remote if the COVID situation warrants simply by adjusting the bell schedule rather than the underlying structure of the master schedule. Is that correct? Yes, and it does it in a way that doesn't significantly upend the teacher planning either. So that if we get all our teachers vaccinated uh, by the beginning of April, which is what the governor seems to think we should be doing and is, is in his, uh, uh, is his plan, we can aggressively bring more in-person days in under the departmental shift whereas we might not be able to do it in some sort of a hybrid split, correct? Correct. I think the logic is pointing in the direction of going to a departmental shift. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Allison Abbey. Um, okay, so I've been listening in as I drove and uh, let me, but I have to try and put everything together. First, um, I wanted to acknowledge that what we've, okay, so my understanding is this is more questions and then we may have motions and discussion of motions. So I'm focusing there, but um, what I'm hearing from parents is, uh, parents and students, um, is that some feel that the current school model is going, working well enough or some even feel even better than that. Some feel it's going so-so, and then there are some, um, and I don't know exactly how many, who feel it's going very poorly for their students, and that those students, they feel those students in particular would benefit from having um, a um, AB hybrid as we have in, uh, two cohort AB hybrid as in the middle school and such. Um, I wanted to get some clarity about a couple things. First, I think part of what is confusing or part of where this is, to me seems like it's coming from is because when we initially asked people back in the fall, we asked, would you like to sign up for a AB cohort? At that point, we did not realize that it was not schedulable. So it was an ask that ultimately we couldn't deliver. But I feel like that's been lost. People feel like because we asked if we could do this, I mean, we asked if you wanted to do this, we asked parents, is who I mean by you, people think it can be done. And they continue to request it. And there was a lot of discussion as, as the plans changed, as more information came available about where HVAC was heading, but especially where um, 
the capacities of rooms and stuff headed, it became clear that it we can't do it and staff a, have both a two cohort model and a remote remote um, uh, remote hybrid option and have the classes that people want in both of them. One of them is gonna not work. Um, I mean, one of them is not gonna provide the selection that people want, but I still feel that people are looping back to that and saying, but you ask, so it must be out there somewhere. You know, we're, we're just, we, we've lost it. We, if we're creative enough, if we work hard enough, we can find it and we can make it happen. And I think it's been lost that that's not, that, unfortunately never existed. Um, so the questions that I have are under the departmental shift, what are the things we can do for the parents who feel it is going so poorly for their students? So I, I mean, I think I tried to answer that. So there are a number of in-person options available currently to students who are, I mean, to who are struggling. There's the Learning Center, there's the Harbor Program, there's Workplace. Special education students are available um, to come into the building and all have been offered that. Um, there are there we we are in working with interface and AYCC and others to contact to direct people towards um, mental health services if they need that. We are planning the COVID nineteen screening in January, where we will identify students who are at tier three to be referred to treatment, but also students who are tier two to participate in social emotional support groups. Yes, um, I get some. Thinking of the ones who their parents feel they would benefit from in person, more direct in person school. So it sounds like the first well, things yeah. that you mentioned are more. Right. Well, but I'm doing... just doing right okay. there. Yeah. Learning Center, Harbor, Workplace, Special Ed, those are all programs that are currently available. Mm -hmm. okay. um, in addition, and this was the thing we talked about, that with a couple of FTE, um, we believe that we could create a program. They would support core requirements, English, math, science, and social studies um, for students, most likely as an AABB cohort, depending on the numbers. Um, and we would, we're hoping to be able to A, obtain staff to do it because um, we need to find people to hire, which is not, not, not an automatically a given. Um, and, um, and then to identify populations that, that are interested in doing that. Um, I will say that many folks that have come to us and said that, you know, my student is, is, is struggling, have been offered services, but have not chosen the services that we've offered. Not all, many are obtaining the services. Um, and so, you know, th those are the options at the moment that we have available to us. And then also, and I think this is really important for many, I mean, there are different issues, right? Social interaction versus mental health versus, you know, if the issue is executive function, if the issue is engagement, there are gonna be different interventions. And so um, I think for us to have the conversation with individual parents to try to figure out how to connect people um, to the right services is also gonna be important. Okay. And then the other question I had about departmental shift, and I know you touched on this a little bit, but just review it for me, please, because I didn't hear everything as I was driving. Um, how would we handle if things get better and we can bring more kids back? How will we have, how will we have more in-person class time under departmental shift? So it, it depends on how the constraints are changed. Mm -hmm. So as the constraints if, if the constraints are changed in ways that let us have larger groups of kids in rooms, so if all of a sudden all of our rooms can easily handle 12 kids um, because the constraints have been shortened to that amount, then we would then we would potentially have the option to offer an AB. But if we offered an AB, 
um, it wouldn't it, it would require most likely some level of remote academy. So we would have to ask the community at that time, you know, is the appetite there to be able to come in half the time? And the trade-offs are, right? The the trade-offs are some loss in diversity of instruction, change in classes. You halfway through the semester would be challenging, but we're, we're clever folks. We can do it if we have to. And the second would be the loss of instructional time. You'd go from the four or five days a week to two to three days a week, um, depending on how we configured it. So, and I don't know at that time what the appetite of the community would be. And so we'd have to ask that question. I'm pretty confident that, you know, the other issue is also going to be the impact that it would have on staff um, and the impact and the number of staff that would under those circumstances feel like um, it was appropriate for them to take a leave because I know that has been something that has already happened. And we've already had staff request leaves of absence just from the burden of teaching and all of the changes that they're doing right now. Um, and so that would be the other thing. We'd have to look and see what the trade-offs were. If the option was that we didn't need to do social distancing um, and that we would all fit in the building, then it wouldn't be, and then we could bring them back full-time. The schedule would work as a full-time school if there's room in the building to do so. Um, and then beyond that, the last is as we have more ability to have more kids together as the levels go down and the risk goes down as the staff become less at risk as a result of running those activities i foresee simply having more events more activities more social distancing the weather is going to get warmer um, people will start gathering outside and doing more social events so i, I think I, I do hope that there's a real sort of awakening in april just in general where we can you know have the giant dance parties out on the um on the pierce field or run a you know an outdoor musical with social distancing i just don't know until we see what the specific guidelines are what we'll be able to do okay thank you mr hainer i'll defer my time until the motion okay great um i just had a couple of uh, quick comments i'm glad that we're uh talking about Wednesdays, I think that's uh, I think that's really important. It's a theme we've heard from families, and we've it's come up at the school committee over and over again. Um, so I hope that there continues to be movement on that. I appreciate that uh, you're not there yet on a plan to share with us, but I I hope we get there because um, it's certainly something that that I've heard here many 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 times. Um, I think the other piece this this whole idea that um, I, I feel like we get stuck in a lot of sort of hyperbolic language. The, the idea that coming into school in person has to be a panacea for everything that's wrong with the pandemic, to me, like, that's ridiculous. Like, that is not my expectation. It is not the expectation of this community. And I, it, I find it frustrating that that's the expectation that we're putting on our schools or our teachers. I have an eighth grade daughter. She is not a ninth grader. I do not have a high school student, but on her in-person days, she wakes up and she's ready to go and she leaves the house because she's going into school yes to see some of her classmates and her friends but she's going to see Ms. Carlson who's going to teach her algebra and she's going to see Ms. Packer who's going to critique her writing and then critique her writing again and um, she is is proud to go and have those experiences I don't believe as a parent that it is a panacea for everything that is wrong I would never put that burden on my kids as teachers but it is valuable for her to go and see them and have those interactions Actions with them in person and to talk to Mrs. Ford about her artwork and to engage in her work in person. So I, I, you know, we, we went through this in August. We talked about how it was going to be so hard because there were going to be masked and everything was going to be difficult. And the reality is for a lot of these kids, and again, we have to be very, very careful. There are so many cases there's a lot going on and we must be careful, but this idea that we, we, we have to expect that, that somehow to make in-person learning what we need to do, that it somehow has to cure all of these things. It doesn't, it, but it does have to help and it does support them. And I have so much faith in our educators, those who can be in person with kids who can work with them, it's extraordinarily valuable. So I, I just, I don't like putting so much pressure on it that 
it, it becomes so impossible to do. Um, so I'm glad we're talking about Wednesdays. I think we need to be realistic about what we can do to support kids. And, and part of that is having those opportunities to be in person. I, um, I agree with Mr. Cardin. I, I, I mean, I am willing to go if, if there is not another viable option, then I can, you know, we can do the departmental shift. I do think, you know, the, the pressure for movement, if possible, and with the guidance of the Department of Health, once there are vaccinations available, I think is really significant. I mean, you know, uh, Charlie Baker came out there and said that K-12 educators are going to get a vaccine likely before my 77-year-old dad, right? And, and that's, I'm fine with that. I think that, you know, they're setting the levels, the, the prioritization, but at some point, you know, we're, if we are able to do so in the later spring and certainly moving into the fall, um, it's going to be really important that we're able to move. And, and I've appreciated the, um, the, I, I have had, it, it has been easier tonight for me to understand how a departmental shift could switch or could become a more viable in-person option were, you know, should we come to a place where there can be relaxation around social distancing. And I'm not projecting when or how that will come to pass, but um, I do think, you know, I, I hope that we get there and I think that we need to continue uh, talking about that. So I don't actually think I have any questions because um, I think they were asked by um, by my colleagues earlier. So um, I know that there were that there are a few. Um, so I know Mr. Hainer has a motion. Um, so let's start with that one and discuss that one, and then see uh, see what else we have. Thank you. I'll be offering a motion to the for the committee to entertain. But first, before doing that, I wish to make a statement. During the past nine months, the faculty and the administration with parents and of course all the students have gone way above and beyond what anyone could expect. Teachers have had to rethink how to deliver education with minimal and often no physical interaction with their students. They have had to develop ways to engage students in activities that require students to be remote or maintain physical separation. This is contrary to good educational pedagogy. Teachers have had to create lessons with little or no warning that could have re require total retooling to a, for another form of delivery. They have done this and are continually striving to develop and hone new and innovative approaches. Building administrators have had to develop schedules that like the lesson plans must be responsive to changes of the pandemic. I wanna share that counselor staff have contacted me praising the work their principals have done on their behalf. Top administrators have had to develop totally new approaches to hiring staff and purchasing materials that are unique to making students and staff safe. I personally want to commend the entire staff for their tireless work and dedication they have given to the children, parents, and town of Arlington. I want to recognize the tremendous sacrifices parents have had to make during this time. The families had to adapt to parents working from home with all the adjustments that can bring. Families have had to find a way to deal with children home full or part-time while both parents had to go to work. Families that felt that they were not getting enough of the proper information about programs being offered at school. Families that have expressed concerns for their child's social and emotional welfare. Families that were concerned that their child was falling behind in academics. All of the families are to be commended for their concerns on how they have weathered them, most of all, their advocacy on behalf of their children. There's been a great deal of concern and frustration regarding the offerings for the spring programming at the high school. During the past week, I have heard from many parents, those supporting a program presented by Dr. Jenga and those who want the two cohort AABB model. I've also heard from several high school students who participated in the meeting yesterday on this topic. At the August 10th, 2020, August 10th, 2020 meeting, this board voted to support a two cohort AABB program for the high school. In November, we were told that it could not be implemented because the building could not accommodate the population. Many people, some on this board too, feel that there is a need to, for specific data to affirm this statement. The motion I will make is to request a survey to determine if a two cohort AAB program can be initiated within the restrictions established by the Board of Health. It is not the intent of this motion to suggest 
that the two cohort AABB program will be initiated. It is the intent to support creating a program of study to be implemented if health conditions allow this board so directs. Therefore, I move that we suspend any decision regarding programming at the high school for one week and have the superintendent direct the principal of the high school to create a survey with the following question on it. Would you send your child to a two cohort AABB program if it was offered in the spring? Yes or no? No other qualifier should be on this uh, survey. All right. Thank you. So uh, motion by Mr. Hayner. Mr. Hayner, can you give us- oh, Second for the purposes of discussion. Right. Second from Dr. Allison Ampey um, on a motion from Mr. Hayner. Um, Mr. Hayner, can you, just so that I don't oversimplify, can you give me the language of the motion, like just the motion part again? Okay, thank you. Um, let's see to suspend any decision regarding program at the high school for one week, then have the superintendent direct the principal of the high school to create a survey, survey with the following question on it. Would you send your child to a two cohort AABB program if it was offered in the spring? Yes or no? If I may just add one more comment. It is not my intent to promote this as a uh, program. It is to get the data that I think has not been given. I think when this question or forms of this question have been asked, there have been qualifiers in it that may have skewed the data. That's all. This is not a reflection on prior surveys. Thank you. All right. So second from Dr. Allison Ampey. And um, so discussion on this. Dr. Allison Ampey. So I will be voting against this motion because as written, it again suggests the possibility of the existence of a workable to cohort model, which I feel was discussed quite a bit in the fall. And ultimately I do not believe exists given the constraints of the building, the COVID restrictions, and the staffing needed for both um, a remote hybrid and a uh, two cohort, I'm mean, sorry, remote option and a two cohort thing. What I mean by staffing not being available is we wouldn't be able to adequately give course selection to one or the other or both groups. And so, I think to put something like this out would be very misleading and would just, it, it would create more problems such as we've been seeing, I feel that result from the fall, so. Um, can we, uh, before we go to you, Mr. Thielman, can we uh, do a movement on the 10 o'clock rule? So move. We have to give it time. So I think we're going to move the 10 o'clock rule to 11 o'clock. Second. Um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Off my list. Ms. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Hickman? Yes. Mr. Wiener? Yes. I am also yes. Go ahead, Mr. Thielman. I I'm going to support Mr. Um, Hainer's motion. I think that. Um, the, the survey can add in the information that Dr. Janger shared uh, in my questions with him a few minutes ago <clears throat> about would you be in favor, would you opt for this model given all of these restrictions? I think it's a chance for the, the school's leadership, the district's leadership to lay out uh, in more detail what this hybrid model would look like in general terms or a little more specifics about what the restrictions would look like, a range of what the restrictions would look like. I think it's important that uh, parents see that. And then I think it's important that we get the data. I, um, I think if the restrictions are clearly explained and the limits on course offerings are clearly explained, um, <clears throat> we might get information that would make us feel 
better about the ultimate decision. So I'm going to support Mr. Hainer's motion. I think it's a good step to take. I would just say that in addition, I hope the understanding is that <clears throat> the survey should come with several paragraphs explaining clearly the models uh, that were outlined in Dr. Jenger's um, report combined, you know, the different hybrid models and the limitations on them so parents can see that. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. So um, I, I'm interested in the idea of a survey. I'm not sure that the, the, the limitations that Mr. Hainer has put on it is appropriate, but we'll get to that. Um, so, I mean, we, Dr. Jenger talked about implementing a hybrid model, you know, halfway through the term, the semester, if, if things are relaxed. Um, but anytime we try to do that, we're going to have the same issues. We're going to have people who want to stay remote. We're going to have, um, uh, 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 it's going to be impossible to, to split up people in the middle of the semester. So I, I don't think it's realistic to talk about switching to an AABB split in the middle of the semester. If we can't do it at the start, we're not gonna be able to do it at the middle. We might be able to do it at the start if only 30% or 40% are interested that they can fit in the building. Obviously we'd have an issue with, with rejiggering course selection. Those one-off courses, if, if it's a 60-40 split, those one-off courses would be offered in the remote academy and the kids coming in the hybrid would have to remote into them. Some of them may not, you know, all three classes that they have may be stuck in the remote academy. And even if even though they want hybrid, they won't be able to really get anything in person because they happen to have three classes that are only offered remotely. But there could be quite a few who have one or two classes that are, that are in person because they've got English and math and we've got lots of sections of those. Um, so I think it's worth gathering the data. I don't know that um, the question is formulated in the best way, but um, this is a, this is a, this is something we're gonna we have to do now. Um, we we can't hold out the hope or even the possibility of switching in the middle of the, middle of the semester. It's just not going to happen. It's not realistic to even talk about. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. I appreciate the the idea. The intent of this motion, and I apologize if I wasn't clear, is to affirm that the numbers are, are too big to do. If, they, if the numbers come out the way Mr. Cardin just suggested, maybe it's something that, that it could happen. We were told the main, the reason we would, not, we would not be considering this thing that we passed back in August was because there would be too many students. We never surveyed, the, it's just black and white. Would you participate? I think if you put all the qualifiers on it and offering all the other selections, it's going to skew it just the way it has done before. So I will not, I'm not willing to accept any addition beyond what I did. If people want to change it, then they can make their own motion on it. Thank you. Ms. Exton and then Mr. Schickman. Uh, I don't think the question, the way that it's phrase is going to bring the clarity that we're looking for. The, the different options are nuanced based on what courses are offered, what courses can't be offered, how many students are going to choose remote. Um, so not no, I, I don't think families can um, could commit to an AABB model with just that being the question. Um, I think there's there's too many things going on. Uh, and I, the teachers to have them have to change again from switching to a semester, teaching remote, and then another hybrid, um, model where they have students in front of them and then they're creating asynchronous work for another group. Um, it, it's, it's a lot, it's just been a, a lot to just to, um, and I, I just don't think this one question is gonna give us um, the clarity that, that Mr. Rainer is hoping for or the committee is hoping for. Mr. Schlickman. 
Yeah, I think that the survey question will end up dangling an option in front of parents that the school system can't really deliver or certainly can't deliver in an, in an environment that would be in the best interest of the academic needs of the students. So for, for the reasons why Dr. Allison Ampey stated, uh, I, I can't support the motion either. Thank you. Mr. Thielman and then uh, Dr. Jinger. You know, one thing I would add is that um, if the committee were open to it, we could add a sentence to Mr. Hainer's motion uh, selecting one member of the school committee to work with Dr. Bodie and Dr. Jenger on the final wording of the of the mo of the survey and let them work it out um, and give them the freedom to do that. So I'll just throw that out there as a possibility. Dr. Bodie and then Dr. Jenger. I think there are some constraints that this motion doesn't take into consideration. Um, let me just take an AP course, for example. If, if you had a course that was running with 28 students, which would not be unusual, um, if you broke that class into two of uh, 14 and 14, we have a limited number of rooms in the school that could even hold 14 students with our constraints our six foot constraint. Now you add to that all the other courses that are 25 and above, and you all want those classes to be in the building at the same time, there are constraints there. So there's multiple variables that are going on. Um, I think what I, I've been also hearing is that parents want those courses to be able to be hybrid and not necessarily have the more restricted, you know, algebra one, geometry, the, the fundamental courses at each grade level. The problem is the, the, the building and the constraint we want to have around safety. And I think it's much more complicated than a simple choice around a um, wanting a hybrid. We can offer a small hybrid program in the school that a limit that limits a particular cohort to you know 10 students we we would be able to have those kind of rooms but you're forgetting the class sizes we have at the high school and particularly um, in some courses that are very popular such as AP psychology for example um, so that would mean that if we want hybrid in those courses we may have one section or two sections, but can we have staffing for three or four to meet the room requirements? So there are a lot of unintended consequences of trying to do this and constraints. A lot of students are not gonna be able to get their choice because we are not going to be able to take what we're now maybe have two sections of AP something and now be able to have to have three or four to get it in the, in the school. We, we're not gonna be able to do that. And we're not gonna be able to hire these people in the current market. So we have the constraints of the faculty we have, the certifications they have, the size of the school we have, and it's not possible to do everything everyone would like to have happen. We would like it too. I'm not, we would very much want uh, to have uh, students and parents and everyone get what they would like. But it really doesn't work the same way as K-8. It just doesn't. And somebody also earlier, Mr. Slickman pointed that out. You have a single teacher or you have a, you have a, a, a learning community. All of the classes in the high school, students may not even you know, you're going to get a mix in all of the different classes. It's not, it doesn't operate the same way. So I think to offer a very simple choice is missing the complexity of the situation. But can we offer a smaller hybrid? We can. Uh, but more in the neighborhood of, you know, 50, maybe 60 stu um, uh, students, and that's assuming we can hire the staff to do that. So I just, I, 
I realize if you don't live in the world of high schools and understand schedules, um, it's a little bit harder to understand why this is as constrained as it is. And so I just want to offer those comments as you're considering this. Dr. Jenger. So I guess I'm concerned because I think that this, this is really a, a survey that's angling towards a solution. And I tried very hard in the survey that I gave to be trying to get an understanding of, from, of where the community stood. The question you're asking of would you do a hybrid was, this, was asked to some extent in a realistic frame with the third cohort, the grade shift two cohort. That was a two cohort model. The time trade-off was comparable, just only every other week. And the realistic loss of inst some instructional diversity was another concern. And that was the least popular of the three models. What we're doing now, it seems pretty transparent, is this idea that if we can say, if it's only 30 or 50% or 40%, that say that they would do the hybrid, then great, because we can fit those people in the building. But what you've now done is taken the other 60% and required them to go into a model now that reduces their offerings as well. And that people were told that they were getting offered this hybrid, but if they're not understanding the trade-offs, then it's not a realistic offering. Um, and it seems to me that with a program that we could offer. I mean, if, if, if we went and built the grade shift two cohort model and half the school district said, or two thirds of the school district said, if that was the popular model and we'd done that and two thirds of people had come back and said, well, we're gonna be remote anyway, then we would have increased the number of shifts. But the reality was ask that question with the same essential trade-offs, um, it was the least popular model with, on every single category of need. And I also want to remind you that it was also the one which raised the most concern among staff. Um, so I, I, I don't think you're going to get the information you want. I think you're going to muddy the waters in what is already a fairly clear response. And I also want to go back to this issue of satisfaction. Satisfaction rates with schools during normal times run about 70%. So an 80% satisfaction rate with the school under these conditions is remarkable. And, um, you know, at the same time, the Mass Inc. survey shows only about 60% of people feel like their schools are, they're satisfied with what their schools are doing. So we know that there are folks that are not happy, which is why, as Dr. Bodhi said, um, we want to target services towards those students. And we believe that we can staff, you know, again, depending on interest um, and, staff availability, you know, we could support 50, maybe even as many as 100 students, although I'm not sure we could get the staff for that. But, um, but to sort of flip this whole thing and understand also, in doing this, we end up where we were last time, which is that the teachers, that all the planning that needs to go in place to make whatever it is we do run well, doesn't happen until January, and now it's a sprint, um, and teachers go into their classrooms not prepared. So I'm very concerned about postponing this. Mr. Heiner. I'd like to preface my statement first off by recognizing how much work you've done, Dr. Jenga, and I applaud it. I've heard nothing but positive things from staff and people that you've worked with, and I mean that sincerely. My concern is from hearing from other parents that when we, the committee back in August, passed the concept of this two cohort AABB, then you asked to come, for us to come back and give you a chance to evaluate it. The main reason for not going forward at the time when you brought it to us was the, the amount of people could not be sustained in this kind of a program. And we did not have any specific data to go along with it. I think the programs that you're offering tonight are, are commendable and, and, the data, and the information that you got going forward. There is that portion of parents out there that feel that they were not given all the information. That was the purpose of this motion, not to change programs, just to come out and reaffirm and validate that too many people would be asking for it and it would not be a way to do it. 
That's my motivation behind this and not to attack you or any of the other programs. Thank you. All right, other comments on this motion. I think the challenge for me is that I know that there are other pieces coming. <laughs> and so it's hard to sort of on the fly, uh, try to pull pieces together um, in thinking about some kind of, you know, Frankenstein type motion here. Uh, <laughs> I know that's not a good analogy. Um, so it, but but we need to take these sort of one at a time. Um, so I guess I think what we need to do if if we're done with discussion on Mr. Hainer's motion, um, I think we need to vote on this one and then see what else see what else we have. Um, so is there any more discussion on the on Mr. Hainer's motion? Okay, so seeing none, um, let's let's vote on this one. Um, so Ms. Exton. No. Mr. Cardin. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. No. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. No. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. All right, so we're not gonna do, so that motion did not pass. All right, so, but we have more, I think. So, or do we not have more? It's also fine. I can't make motions. So, <laughs> Dr. Allison Ampey. Sorry, just a sec, I have to pull up my motions. Okay, so mine are just trying to work to improve the situation that's on the ground. And I had the idea late in the game, as in this afternoon, to send my motion to Dr. Janger and Dr. I mean, uh, Mr. McCarthy. Um, so I haven't gotten their approval. So they can say that these are not super helpful. But um, first, I'm, well, they're all together, but, and they're in Nova's. Um, I move that the school committee authorize the following. One, the sum of $50,000 to be used on purchases such as individual noise canceling headphones that would allow an improved in school experience for study halls, et cetera. Two, the hiring of a survey consultant form, firm, either part-time or on retainer for administration to consult as desired when creating surveys. Three, the sum of $25,000 for the high school principal and staff to safely enhance the social experience for student, of students with a focus on seniors, but to include all students. Again, my aim with these motions is not to increase the burden on Dr. Janger, but rather to give him resources that he can then delegate to others. And my sums are really placeholders. Um, I wanted it to be clear that there is money that we have authorized that can be spent. Um, he mentioned in passing that there are headphones and such in the high school for students to use. From what we were hearing from the students, it doesn't sound like they know about them and also they probably need more. Um, but I just, I think there are things that we can do to improve the in-school experience for students and the social experience for students and that um, I'm willing to put some of our money there to help make it happen. Um, so. Second. All right, discussion on this, Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a good idea. I'd just like to ask uh, Mr. Mason what the line item and the fiscal impact of this is, is the money sitting there? Do we need to do anything more specific or is this just a good thing to do and in, in, in directing this to happen? Mr. Mason, do you have a, I know this wasn't, <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you have for us, Mr. Mason? I'm sorry, cause I'm being distracted, but um, can you repeat what was stated, Paul? I'm sorry. 
Okay. So, so the motion was uh, to direct the sum of fifty thousand dollars to be used on purchases such as individual noise canceling headphones that would allow an improved in school experience for study halls in the sum of twenty five thousand for high school principal and staff to use to safely enhance the social experience of students with a focus on seniors, but to include all students. So we're talking about $75,000 to the high school to improve things with, with a couple of uh, specifics tied to them. Uh, is this consistent with the budget and something we can do? Yes, I believe that's something that we can do. Thank you for asking. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Um, so I, I support the idea. Um, I, I, I would reluctantly vote for the motion. I think this kind of line item budgeting is actually not within our policies because we you know budget in those five budget categories. So I, I understand the intent. It's an extreme circumstance. We want to make sure um, these things are happening. And I, you know, I, I I, I said last week, you know, we should we should hire an event coordinator, and I wasn't being flippant. I mean, I really think we need someone full time or or not full time, part time, but the only thing they they're doing is organizing social events because that's the need that we we that everybody sees. Uh, maybe there's scavenger, you know, scavenger type hunts in the high school building. Um, maybe it's it's a group read where everybody reads a, a short book. And you come to, come in on Wednesday and, and meet in small classes uh, after your advi before your advisory to discuss it. I there, there's got to be some creative ideas um, to bring our community together in person um, for the next four, few months. Um, so uh, I'm going to support this, and I you know I, I strongly encourage Dr. Bodie to to work with her team to start making this happen. Thank you. Mr. Thielman? I, I support this as well, and I think we should just move to a vote. Thanks for letting us know, Mr. Thielman. Would anybody else like to discuss this? Dr. Allison Ampey. I'd be happy for the money to be used for an event coordinator. I was leaving it open in case they had other ideas. All right, anybody else? No, Keto. Um, Ms. Exton. Yes. So, Dr. Allison Ampey's motion uh, about seventy-five thousand dollars spread over a couple of uh, categories. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. Okay. Mr. Thielman. So I move that the Arlington School Committee endorses the departmental shift as described this evening for the second semester um, and <clears throat> a hybrid option as articulated by Dr. Bode this evening, period. Second. All right, let's talk about this one. Mr. Thielman, do you wanna to speak to this motion? Um, or I, I, well, I will. Yes, I will. Yeah. I mean, I think that, look, I, I, um, I think that, uh, I, I appreciate the desire to, uh, have interventions, uh, for kids, but I think the student who spoke, spoke well, they want to be back in the school. So whatever we can do to start to bring students back to the school, uh, is a good idea. Um, I, 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 main, I maintain the position uh, that I, I stated earlier about uh, my impression of, of some of the feedback. Um, and um, I hope that going forward, we can have uh, healthy discussions about um, what's best for kids in that school. Thank you. So I'm gonna vote for that. Mr. Cardin. Uh, so, I, I'm still stuck on the issue of of getting out of this departmental shift model and, and getting more in person uh, activity in the spring as things get better. So, in the just to be clear, 
in the departmental shift, for every additional shift we, we are able to add, we're taking away a class for those kids that are gonna stay remote. So because we're not doing a sorting at the beginning, the classes are mixed. There, there, you know, there is on, on Mr. Shookman's Facebook post today, there was a parent who said, my kid's not going back until they get the vaccine. It doesn't matter that the teachers get the vaccine and, and numbers, regardless of numbers, their kids aren't gonna come back. So we, we're gonna be required to have a remote option for the rest of the year. So every time we add, we try to add, let's say English is every week instead of every two weeks, that's gonna take an English class away from somebody. Um, so there's gonna be a very quickly, once a week is probably gonna be the maximum we're gonna be able to get. We already have science at once a week. We already, so the idea that, that there's gonna be suddenly significantly more in-person activity ever this year is just not realistic in this model. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I, I guess I will reluctantly support it, but uh, you know, I, I really wish we could take some time, find out how many people are interested in a 50-50 hybrid and see if we can build a program for those people, not just with the core, you know, 50, 50 students that we're talking about, but uh, you know, maybe it'll be four or 500 students um, that opt for that. And maybe we will be able to build a program for that. We don't, we don't know because we haven't asked. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Mr. Schlickman. Oh, oh, you're back. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Changer, is uh, this motion something you understand and can accomplish? Uh, you're mute. I'm looking up data. Um, right. Yes, I believe so. Excellent. Then I can support it. Thank you. Ms. Exton? Uh, so I'm going to be supporting this motion. I believe that students and teachers need as much synchronous time together as possible, whether that's in person or um, online. And I believe that teachers have already made tremendous adjustments to their practice, to their curriculum design and their delivery of instruction. And they don't need to be asked to completely shift their teaching schedule and structure, and structure again. Um, I also think we need to be careful about relying on the vaccine to make the high school safe. We know that high school students transmit the virus at levels similar to adults, but no, most high schoolers aren't gonna be eligible for the vaccine by April, um, unlike teachers. So only teachers are gonna be getting the vaccine by the spring, and then only children over 16 are eligible for the current vaccine that's being, we're waiting to have approved. Um, so I think it's, it's a little presumptuous to think that we can reduce the spacing for students just because the teachers are vaccinated against the virus at the high school level. Um, so I am planning to support the departmental shift model because of the amount of synchronous time it offers to teachers and students and because it ma maintains the semesterized schedule um, for teachers and for students who need that consistency of structure. Thanks. Dr. Altanampi. I'll support this motion also for the reasons so eloquently stated by Ms. Exton. All right, anybody else on this one? Um, so I, you know, I think that the challenge here and I share Mr. Cardin's concerns, um, about and and I I talked about this all in August and all in September that if there is going if you're going to run a hybrid then you have to do the sort first and not only does an increase in a departmental shift model mean that there really 
is less of a viable option for students who want to be remote. On the end game, on the back end, there also isn't a viable option for teachers who need to be remote on the front end. And that's part of what is so appealing about the very challenging K-8 model. There was at least the ability at the beginning to sort teachers and sort kids and come up with two models that ran together. I recognize that the high school is way more complicated and the space is an issue and the numbers are uncertain. Um, but it it is, it's it's hard to, you know, we, we can't change course again, right? So I I share Mr. Cardin's concerns um, that that you know that that it's tricky to find flexibility with this, um, both for teachers on the front end and students on the back end. So those are my thoughts. Um, I I don't I don't feel like there's other choices. So <laughs> um, so so we'll do this one and and we'll you know do the best we can which I have no doubt that um, when I talked to teachers at the beginning of the year, I remember I, I had, it was given like 60 seconds to speak, which was appropriate, probably too much. Um, and uh, I remember saying that I knew that, that they would give our students their very best because they always have. And, and I believe that very much um, still, probably even more so. So, um, all right. So any more conversation about the motion by Mr. Thielman? Mr. Thielman. Yeah, so I just want to say, I mean, what you said, Ms. Morgan, and what Mr. Cardin said, do you have any suggestions on how to amend the motion to incorporate mm -hmm. the views? I mean, I, I guess I would, I would like to understand what this, you know, sort of limited hybrid option is that Dr. Bodhi talked about. So I suppose I would like to put more provisions around that piece, I guess, so that we could, you know, get an update on, because it's it's kind of, I mean, I know that it has been buried in the slides that we've seen for weeks now, but it, I feel like it's only just sort of come into, um, it's not even in focus for me yet, but it's it sort of only come to my consciousness, you know, in the last day or so. Okay. Um, I, I might then my suggestion would be my suggestion to you is that we vote on this now. I can make a follow-up motion on to, to what you articulated, I think. You get a report for the next week. Mr. Cardin, do you have more comments or well, I mean, I think Jeff, your original written motion that um talks about um combining the, the departmental shift with a hybrid model it is a little bit more open-ended. So instead of referring to the one Dr. Bodhi discussed, why not say a hybrid model that meets unmet needs? I accept that friendly amendment. It's well articulated. So Mr. Thielman, can you? Yeah, move that the Arlington School Committee endorses the departmental shift model for the second semester, coupled with a hybrid option that meets unmet needs. Dr. Allison Ampey. I'm a little concerned that that's starting to open doors that I don't really know where they're going. Um, I think what Dr. Bodhi was talking about before was limited. Um, I was a little uncomfortable with it to begin with, but Dr. Tanger felt that he could work with it, so I was okay. But I'm worried when you start adding that unmet needs, it, it, it has, to me it has the potential to balloon. And I, this, I would prefer that these things are separated into, a, into two motions. Mr. Schlickman? I, I agree. I think that uh, the original motion was reasonable. I think that we're the, amending it opens some kettles of fish. And I, I would like to 
maintain the fact that at this point the motion gives direction in the sense of the committee uh, the committee without going to specificity that will box us in and cause problems so uh without the friendly amendment i'm in favor of the motion i'm not really in favor of it with with the friendly amendment all right so we're, we're wordsmithing on the fly which is always dead. mr Carden, do you have a suggestion Uh, no, I mean, my intent is not what, what Mr. Schlickman and Ms. Dr. Allison Amphi would would want and perhaps not what a majority wants. So I guess so we maybe just we could do a separate motion. Would, would, maybe we can do a separate motion on that. Sure. Okay, so why don't we do this? Why don't, why, I'm, I'm sorry to jump over here, everybody here. So why don't we just do what I said first, which is move that the Arlington School Committee endorses the departmental shift model for the second semester, coupled with uh, the hybrid option presented this evening by Dr or articulated this evening by Dr. Bodie. And vote on that one, and then we can try a second motion. And if there's a majority for the second motion, there is. If there isn't, there isn't. All right, so any more discussion on that motion? Okay, no. Uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? No. Dr. Allison Lindsay? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. Okay. So now. Mr. Carden should make the motion. Sure. I move that the superintendent is directed to uh, expand on her hybrid program to meet other unmet needs. Second. Discussion. Yep. Just, just one quick point of order on this. On the, wouldn't it be good to have a, a time, Mr. Cardin? Uh, sure. By the by, our January the first meeting in January. January fourteenth. Oh, that's really late. Is that enough time? Well, Dr. Bodie. I, I'm not clear what this motion is about. Um, in the last motion. Um, Dr. Janger as well expressed, you know, what we would be able to manage um, for a second semester, which would be a limited, a hybrid program with some of the fundamental courses that students would need for graduation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we are certainly interested, and I thought it was a good suggestion, that maybe we have to hire somebody uh, to help with some uh, event planning. Um, I'm not sure we need a motion for that because we, we think it's a good idea. Uh, but I'm not sure what this means, unmet needs. Um, it, it seems very broad. Um, we're not envisioning that we're going to offer AP classes in a hybrid model uh, or singleton mm -hmm. electives in a hybrid model. That's not what we were talking about earlier. And also to I appreciated Ms. Exton's comments because I do think teachers are exhausted and have to switch their, their entire, you know, uh, planning uh, at mm -hmm. this time would be really quite a burden. So I appreciated those comments. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, I'm looking at the original motion and the discussion we had in that adding a hybrid section of English 10 or English 11 or geometry or the other uh, core sections that are offered in bulk uh, layered on top of the, uh, the departmental shift, I think is, is sort of the way this would end up working uh, to add in additional language. Uh, if we're talking about creating a hybrid that meets the needs of the people who are unhappy and want the hybrid, I, I think ends up uh, setting ourselves up to fail. And, and I think we should leave uh, well enough alone. Thank you. All right further discussion on Mr. Cardin's motion. 
Dr. Allison Ampey. I'm going to vote against this motion because I feel it's too broad in scope. Um, and I also feel that it's probably not needed in that I think the administration is going to try and help as many of the kids as they can within the constraints of what they can get done with the hybrid motion, with the hybrid model. Dr. Janger. Sorry, I'm not sure about the motion, but let me just tell you what we'll do if you don't make a motion. Um, if, if you don't make a motion, we will promote Harbor Workplace Learning Center Special Education Supports and identify whether there are additional students who are gonna take advantage of those programmings, which do have a wide range of needs, and then consider whether we need to add additional staff in order to support it. We will also then, if we can identify staff to do so, which is an issue, um, work our way up from the remaining students looking at students who need credit recovery to meet graduation requirements. And if then there's still capacity, offer that more widely to the community. But as Dr. Bodhi said, um, we're looking at 50, 50 maybe um, students, maximum about 100 students that we would even be able to staff to do that on top of everything else and have space for. Um, but that's what we will do. We'll try to build that program out and identify those students. Um, I think if you say we have to do it, I'm not sure I'll be able to staff it. Um, I think if you say that, um, I'm not sure that we wouldn't be better served by having some of the students who are looking at, you know, our high levels of academic challenge participate in some of the other in-school support options. So, I mean, I think you can expect from us in January, a presentation to this community about the structure of what the departmental shift is going to look like and a review of ways in which we're expanding other in-person activities and um, launching social activities for the spring. And you can expect that to come from us both in January for academics and then later mid to later January for social events. I don't know that you need a motion in order to push or structure that. And I think in some ways it creates a set of expectations that are confusing to people. All right, more, is there more um, comments on um, Mr. Cardin's motion? Um, so, you know, for me, I think the challenge with it is that I don't, I'm not clear what we're, I, I'm not really clear what we're asking for, <laughs> honestly. So is there more that, is there more you can tell me about it, Mr. Cardin, like what this sort of, what it, what it looks like? I, I, I don't like making motions and pass that, that there's the support for this anyway. So I don't want to take up too much time if, if there's not four votes for it. Um, but I don't like passing motions that then people come back and they're like, well, we really couldn't do that because, you know, of whatever. So can, can, can I hear more about what it, it looks like or what, like what we're asking for? So the, the options that so far have been discussed uh, being an, in addition to the departmental shift, the harbor, the shortstop, this, this credit recovery um, programs, none of that is going to address the, the students whose parents we've been hearing, hearing from. So there is a group of students, um, you know, 20%, 10%, I'm not sure, who are struggling. They may be doing okay academically, but they're struggling socially. And um, they, their parents think they would benefit from a hybrid program. So let's find out who they are, see what classes they need to take, and see what we can build for them. Like I said, a lot of their classes are going to have to remain remote, and they may not, we may not be able to offer them something for them. But if they happen to be enrolled in math and English, and these are the classes that we can offer in person, 
um, then, then we should have a program to be able to do that. Great, thank you. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, I mean, what Mr. Cardin's motion does, in my opinion, is there are students who are not high needs, uh, who may be struggling somewhat academically, uh, who are not doing well uh, with or as well as they would like or as their parents would like with remote learning. They're in their rooms, they're in their attics, they're in their basements, and they're not doing well. And parents have articulated this pretty clearly. And what we've proposed tonight doesn't respond to those needs. And so what Mr. Cardin's motion does is it is it pushes the district leadership to come up with some options to help that segment of the population. That's how I see the motion. That's how I read it. And that's why I'm supporting it. Dr. It's, it's, it's a, it's Sorry, that. Go ahead, Mr. Jenner. Yeah, thank you. So I guess I just have to ask in terms of the role of the school committee, and, and I say this with all differential deference to your role, but is it the role of the school committee to individually sort of mandate specific services to particular parents who are unhappy? And it's not that there aren't folks that are unhappy, but it just seems like we're getting so down into the weeds of our ability to build this out. Um, and I know that there are people out there that are unhappy, right? Um, and those folks will go to the school committee sometimes, they'll come to us and whatever. Um, but I think when you start trying to mandate what the services and the relationship is that's going to be with those folks to service those folks at the school committee level, you're sort of circumventing the, the conversation that they have to have with us. Sometimes we make folks unhappy, right? Sometimes folks say this teacher is terrible and they're doing X, Y, and Z. And we sit down and we're like, we problem solve. Most of the time we come to an agreement, but sometimes they don't like the way the class runs and they are unhappy with the class. And we say, um, this teacher is teaching within the expectations that they're teaching, the student is getting the services they're getting, and it, we have to agree to disagree, and there is an unhappy parent. You get those angry emails all the time, but we don't have a school committee motion directing me to come up with a program to service that parent. Um, and so I, I guess I'm concerned just about the level of detail we're getting into here. We're gonna yeah. go through the needs assessment, we're gonna work with the parents. I think those parents that are not feeling well served um, should engage with the school and we will engage with them to problem solve around how we can support their needs um, and how other programs and services can support their needs. But I'm not sure, I guess I just get concerned about where, where we can come up with a school committee motion to do that. So with all due respect to you, Dr. Janger, I've sat in many meetings with, with you and your team over the last, many weeks where you have told anybody and everybody who would listen that ultimately this would be a school committee decision and you would bring it to them and they would decide. Um, and so it feels a little bit funny now that it's like, well, actually, I'm not sure I like what you're going to decide. And I was going to bring you these three choices and provide you with those. And then you were going to pick one of them. And so it feels a little weird that now, like, you know, we've heard that from you many, many times. So the school committee is going to set, they're going to decide, they're going to decide. That's why people are reaching out to us to tell us what they want, because you've told them that we're going to make this decision. So I, I guess I push back on that idea that we, we get to make the decision, but only within the parameters that you provide us, you know, I, I I don't know that I buy that. I think it's very likely that you're going to get a decision tonight that's within the parameters that you provided us. But I don't feel like I don't feel like you get to provide the parameters and then also say we have to pick one of those. So that's my that's my feedback to you. Okay. No. And I I, I don't want to be interpreted that way. I was more concerned that I feel like I get concerned about the level of detail. But I obviously will do whatever you tell me to do. It is your right and privilege as the school committee. Um, and I understand what you're saying in terms of trying to figure out amongst a very difficult decision. So I appreciate that. So Mr. Hainer and then Mr. Cardin, I saw your hand earlier. Number one, policy is our purview. It's one of the three left by the state and to school committees. 
And we are also, I have the power to direct the superintendent to direct you. To direct you directly, no. You came to us tonight with several programs, programs for us to approve, as Ms. Morgan just stated. Policy belongs to us. Whether you like it or not, you can come to us and tell us we don't have the money, we don't have the staff, then we have to either provide you with the money or staff or the program doesn't work. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Uh, it's all been covered, thank you. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, just very briefly, I just want to clarify, we, we are not getting into a level of individual teacher performance. That's not what this motion is about. Just to be clear, I'm voting for Mr. Cardin's motion because based on that survey, I would say 20% of general ed students are not going to get everything they need um, on the model that we've adopted. And uh, I'm concerned about those kids, and that's why I'm going to support the motion. And we'll see where the vote goes. That's my vote. Thank you. All right. Any more conversation about uh, Mr. Cardin's motion, seconded by Mr. Thielman? Okay. Seeing none. Um, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. No. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. No. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. All right. Um, so are there any more motions on this agenda item? Mr. Thiel. I just have a general question. I'm not sure if it is necessary. I don't know if a, a motion is needed, but you know, one of the things that we talked about at our last meeting was meeting with the Department of uh, Public Health about um, to get a sense of the criteria for the six foot rule. And, uh, and I, this is not to change that rule right now. It's not to change the rule. Without I have an update for that in the future agenda items. You do, you do, I'm sorry. I can, I can do it now. I, well, it's a very small update. I have emailed them requesting said meeting, period. That's my update. You don't need anything else from us. Great, thank you. Well, not, not right now, <laughs> but no, I, I, have, I, have, I asked them if they were, uh, open to coming to one of our two January meetings. And if that timing wasn't convenient, I mean, we can't compel them to come, right? So we can just ask. Um, and if that didn't work, then if there was a time in January, um, you know, that that I would, I would rally the troops and I committed all of you to going at the time they told us to. So I will circle back on that, but. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Good yep. job. It's the, the email is out there, so. Um, okay, any more motions on the uh, 7.50 p.m. AHS hybrid options discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, let's move on. We're gonna start flying here. I've got it. We're gonna dispense of a bunch of these before we have to move the 11 o'clock rule. Uh, the Jason Russell House CPA application support. Um, I have my name on this. This was a request from Mr. Hainer. I believe that it is uh, directing me to write a letter in support of the application. Is that correct, Mr. Hainer? Yes, it is. Okay, dope. On, on like behalf of the school committee. Oh, absolutely. All right. Um, is there anybody that would like to direct me to do that? I move to direct the. I move to direct the superintendent, uh, the chair of the Arlington School Committee, to write said letter. Super. All right. Is there a second? Second. Second. Oh, look at all you guys jumping in here. Okay. Uh, any discussion about this? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Alice Nampy. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Shipman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. I am also yes. All right, super. Um, next, vote approval of the 2020-2021 budget calendar. Dr. Alice Nampy, I believe this is a second read. Is that correct? That is correct. I move that we approve it as we do our final approval. Second. Great. Anybody want to talk about this? Nope. Good. Liz, uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Ms. Gilman. Yes. Ms. Sickman. Yes. Meaner. Yes. I am also yes. All right. Election Modernization Committee. Um, I don't believe that I put the email in Novus, but I might have done. Nope, I didn't. Um, so we had a request. Um, so the as part of what town meeting did, um, they opted 
to um, change the way. Um, something happened with the Election Modernization Commission Committee that we appointed Jennifer Seuss to when she was a school committee member. She was appointed to that committee. They changed their formation at town meetings such that we can appoint somebody to that committee who is not a sitting member of the school committee, which is kind of neat for us because as it turns out, Ms. Seuss is still willing to serve on that committee. So uh, as requested by the chair reached out to us, uh, to myself and to Mr. Hainer, Mr. Hainer being the chair of the community relations subcommittee, um, being that if we were going to go through a, a, a more uh, robust appointment process, we would run it through his subcommittee. Um, so I am bringing it to you with a recommendation that given that she uh, is a former member of the school committee, barring what I, I maybe there's somebody here tonight who would like to be considered to serve, which is fine. Um, so I, I guess we need to have a little conversation if anybody wants to do it. And if people uh, have an issue with uh, appointing Ms. Jennifer Seuss to serve um, on the election modernization committee. So uh, conversation, Dr. Allison Ampey. I move to appoint Dr. Seuss as our representative on the election modernization committee. Second. Great, anybody wanna talk about it? Mr. Hainer. Briefly, uh, I would just ask that uh, either in the motion or some way to have her report to us at least once a year. Accept as a friendly amendment. Great. All right. Any more conversation? Mr. Schlickman. Yeah. As the election modernization committee was attempting to bring us uh, into uh, ranked choice voting as a multi-seat committee, uh, I would hope that uh, going forward, she would come to us then and discuss this with us before any votes are taken to move us into a different electoral scheme. Great. All right, anybody else? Okay, um, let's vote. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Charles Nampy? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Lickman? Yes. Mr. Painter? Yes. I am also yes. Okie doke, uh, 1056, Mr. Mason, how long do you need for your end of the year 2020 report? Are you still here? Yeah, of course you are. I'm still here. Um, of course you are. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't have to do much. I mean, Let's I think this- the rule and then you can give us a little piece of it and then we'll see if people have questions. Does that sound good? It's, I mean, it sounds good. Sounds great, whatever you like Super to do. Super great, right? Okay. <laughs> um, do we have movement on 11 p.m., which we're imminently approaching? Move to change the end time to 11.30. Second. Okay, great. Um, okay. Ms. Exton? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. 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 Oh. yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Okay, let's just, did you have a comment on that, Dr. Allison Ampey, or no? I had a comment on, on the end of year report. I'm just wondering if we could do it next month. I mean, next week instead, just push it. Is anybody not in favor of that? I'm blowing your mind now, not in favor. Did you catch that? Okay. Yes. All right. Good. So did I get my vote on 1130? Not yet. All right. No, we're going to no. get... I want my vote on 1130. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Ms. Hillman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Wiener? Yes. I'm also yes. Okay. So Mr. Mason, we're going to bunt you to next week. Is that all right? That's fun. Okay, cool. Uh, superintendent's report, Dr. Bodie. You're on mute. Um, I really just want to give an update on the high school um, and can talk more about this next week, but the good news is that we've entered into an agreement with our uh, consequently construction and uh, have a guaranteed maximum price called the GMP. And we are a million dollars under our original budget for construction that the voters uh, approved uh, in June 19th. Uh, and we were able to add in a number of things that were um, people had wanted to have at the time. 
And that included lighting on the field, uh, the Minuteman um, uh, walkway that would come down from the bike path to the school grounds. Um, it would also include a traffic light at Mill, at Mill Street, uh, additional insulation, the Performing Arts Wing, and uh, improvement in HVAC system so that we have um, uh, a better filtration system should we ever have something similar to the pandemic. And actually during flu season, it would be great as well. So it involves an ionization system and a higher grade of uh, filtration. Uh, that's it, that's pretty quick. I, I would also encourage people to look at our website because there are some great videos there that you would um, appreciate seeing. Great, that was that, that was, was quick. That was really good. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Bodie? Seeing none, uh, we're gonna. Oh, Mr. Cardin, really? Okay. Yeah, cool. sorry. There's snow. There's snow in the forecast next week, Dr. Bodie. Thank you, Mr. Cardin. Uh, a lot or a little? Uh, could be a significant amount. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that, Len. Thank you. Well, he's, a lot of districts uh, have shifted. Their, a lot of districts have shifted their policy, but we haven't announced anything yet. Uh, correct. Um, that's correct. We'll see how the weather forecast goes, but we can shift into remote, um, and I think that that is the what, what we can we can try it and see how it works. And um, I think one of the issues with snow days is whether we want to add days onto the end of the year or people have a break, you know, you know, now and that's what that would occur or do we want to just shift into remote? And I think the sentiment throughout the district right now is to shift into remote. But we're also thinking that we might not do a, a full day and let teachers have their lunch and prep in the afternoon planning time then. Do, do you need anything from us, Dr. Bodhi, to do that? Okay, super. Nothing. All right, great. Um, so, but you're gonna let people know about this when? Of course I will. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll take a look at the forecast and uh, give people a heads up. That would be super. And. and Okay, I don't want to talk about this right now. All right, great. Um, is anybody else for this? Super. Um, so uh, vote amendment of the contract for Michael Mason, who is our CFO. Um, Dr. Bodie, do you want to introduce this one or do you want me to? I'm happy to, or you're welcome to. Yes, why don't you do that? Great. Um, so we... Um, voted in executive session, gosh, maybe a week ago. So we have been very fortunate to have um, Mr. Mason as our CFO. Uh, he is in the um, third, he is in the third year of his contract, well into it, being that it's December. Um, and so we were in a position to, um, to amend that and then extend it for the next um, three year period. Um, and we were able to um, meet some of the things that that he needed from us, as well as uh, meet the needs of our district, which is to keep him here. Um, our needs are, are very simple and uh, uh, explicit. And uh, we are very fortunate to have him. Um, he has been um, just such a joy to work with. He is kind and funny and humble. And um, he makes beautiful reports that he to us um, with great amounts of patience, me especially. Um, he, uh, he can engage with us if we're excruciatingly prepared down to the decimal point or if we're more hazy about what's going on. Um, he, he, he moves in, in so many different directions um, and the feedback that we've gotten about him um, from all of the various places that this district sends him out to um, at all hours of the day and night um, where he represents us well um, has just been uh, so uh, positive and they are so appreciative of his hard work. Um, and so I'm really 
grateful that um, we were able to come to um, an agreement over a contract to keep him here with us. Um, so that's that's all I have to say. Um, but I'm wondering if anybody else would has anything they want to add to that. Mr. Cardin. Sure, so it, you stated it very eloquently, but um, you know, I was on the search committee that, that brought Mr. Mason in. Uh, he, this was a large promotion for him, uh, and you know, we we were able to get him at a sort of a bargain price, and now uh, he's excelled, and he's really one of the the, the top achieving CFOs in the area. Uh, very quickly has has uh, filled um, uh, the, the position, and so we brought him up to. Uh, market salary and able to, to keep them here. Um, that's terrific, a big win for the district. Thank you. Any others? All right. Mr. Thielman? I just want to echo the comments of my colleagues. I think we're, we're lucky to have Mr. Mason. He does a great job and um, I hope he stays with our district for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hainer and then Dr. Ditto. Ditto. Dr. Allison Ampey. Same, ditto. Do we have a, um, a motion for Mr. Mason's contract, Mr. Schuchman? Uh I move that we approve the amendment to the current contract and, and, the, con uh, and the new contract and authorize the chair of the school committee to sign it on our behalf as this is a wonderful thing to do. Second. Um, any more conversation? All right, great. Um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Schickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. I'm also yes. We're glad to have you, Mr. Mason. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, okay, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Vote approval of warrant 21107. Warrant mm, dated 11-10-2020. Total amount 7519210.42. I'm going to the wrong place there, though, guys. Hang on. Do we think it's 7519210 Is that possible? There's a lot of numbers. Does anybody have this? Because either the comma's in the wrong place or it's a $7 million warrant. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I don't know, guys, but that seems like a big one. All right. Um, I'm... Read the... Read the other ones and I'll look up the number. Okay, vote approval of warrant. Warrant number 21113 dated 11-24-2020. Total amount $714,070.20. Warrant, vote approval of warrant. Warrant number 21130 dated 12-8-2020. Total amount 386657.59. Vote approval of minutes September 24th, 2020. October 8th, 2020. October 28th. Second, 2020 regular minutes. Um, vote to approve Kathleen Bodie as Arlington representative for EDCO Board of Directors for 2020 2021. So it's just that 21107 warrant. We just yeah. double. It's okay. 751. Oh, wait, sorry. Yeah. Karen has it. It's. Oh, go ahead. Anybody? 751, 920, and 42 cents. 920.42? Yes. All right. So vote approval of warrant 21107 dated 11-10-2020. Total amount 751920.42. So move. Second. Second. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Newman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Weiner. Yes. I am also yes. Um, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget. We will meet next week. Look for the doodle tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Community relations, Mr. Hainer. Uh, we had our third uh, com uh, school committee chat last Saturday. It went well. Tomorrow we'll be meeting uh, at 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, CIAA, Mr. Cardin. 
Uh, we've met to go over the high school stuff, which we discussed. Thank you. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policy, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, it looks like we have something for the agenda. We'll schedule at the beginning of the next year, uh, next calendar year. Okay. Um, superintendent search process, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, we're done. Right. But maybe let's hold it and pull it off. Do we have to do anything to pull it off? Uh, no, uh, no, not yet. We could just leave it uh, there. If there's any mopping up we have to do, we might have to deal with uh, MASC on the contract. Uh, yeah, who knows? Okay, no. Um, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. Uh, go by the school and see it. We're not going to allow visits for a while, but you'll see the building going up. Super. Uh, liaison reports. Announcements. Future agenda items. So I have a uh, future agenda item. Uh, Dr. Bodie's evaluation is up next Thursday. Um, be here uh, the 17th. Uh, she got her uh, work to us, which was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Bodie. That was super helpful. Um, much appreciated. And uh, all of you, your due date for her evaluation, which is in your email is 12-14-2020, which is Tuesday, maybe Monday. I don't know, Monday. I've, I've received none of them. So here we go. Um, but if, if you- Excuse me, is yours yes. done? No. Oh, okay, just checking. Yep, it's gonna be great. Uh, so anyway, just a reminder, friendly reminder, so I don't have to send an email. Um, okay, uh, executive session. To enter into executive session, pursuant to Massachusetts General Law, chapter 30A, section 21A, purpose to discuss strategy, in preparation for negotiations of an employment agreement uh, with non-union personnel, specifically Dr. Homan, to discuss pending litigation, McLaughlin versus Desi, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel, or contract negotiations with union and or non-union, which held an open meeting, may have a detrimental effect. Uh, to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which held an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. And will we be coming back? We will not be coming back. So move. Second. Uh, great. Uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. 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 Mr. Hainer? Yes. I am also yes. 